morning. Good morning. Good morning. We, we did hear that our uh, some of our board members are quite a quite a distance, and we want to be able to get everything in today. Um, we're I'll do some of the perfunctory things. We're going to then hold off for the agenda. Well, we can we can. Actually, we don't have a quorum yeah, to actually re redo the agenda. Is anyone on the phone? I leave them. I leave them. Okay. But it's just a matter of redoing the agenda a little bit to move up the... Oh, no, I'm just, I can't remember. Do we need an in-person quorum? Yeah, I think we do. We do. We do. Mm -hmm. yeah. Well, we could even without a quorum start a presentation, I think, right? Yeah. We yeah. just wouldn't yeah, take action. We won't make decisions. Make decisions. So why don't I... I think I can still call the meeting to order, and the time is now 9:35, and a quorum of the board is president. As president, is, uh, <laughs> <laughs> they, this is coffee. This, this is, is coffee. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> the state board of education meeting of December 11 is called to order. I think we'll have to wait on approval of agenda for a quorum. Um, and why don't we wait on the introductions also, since so many are gone. Apologize for doing this. I wish we had an item that um, the board obviously needs to be involved in item D. Why not? Right. Well, I'm wondering if we want to do E instead. What I'm what I'm concerned about is we we have guests here for item C on the arts education mm -hmm. survey. Mm -hmm. I think um, many of our board know the the board pretty much knows a lot about what's going on in Smart of Balance, and we can bring them up to speed. With with your permission, I think I'd move to that one so the board can hear the entire arts version with our guests. Does that make sense? So let's do that. We're going to move right to page nine. Thank you. And it's a presentation on career and college ready standards, implementation, and smarter balanced assessment consortium sample items. Um, this is something that's requested, and department staff are actively engaged in a variety of activities supporting the implementation of what we call the Common Core State Standards in support of career and college readiness for all students. This presentation is going to update and provide an update on these efforts, which includes how the department is beginning to use sample items released by the Smarter Balance Assessment Consortium for the purpose of preparing schools for the next generation of assessments, which are going to be very exciting. Some of the new types of items included on these assessments and how they support the measurement of career and college ready standards that will be shared. Um, we have some folks with us. I'm going to let Deputy Superintendent Sally Vaughn uh, introduce them and then we'll proceed from there. Great. So we are very delighted to give you an update on the career and college ready standards and also showcase some of the SBAC items. As we've been talking with you, now that some of the sample items are available, uh, people have been able and teachers have been able to go in and really look at how challenging some of these questions will be and how different they are from what uh, we currently produce. So with me at the table today is Linda Forward, uh, Director of the Office of Education Improvement and Innovation. Also is Greg Dion, who works in our curriculum and instruction unit with Linda. And then Andy Middlestead is here from BA, the Bureau for Assessment and Accountability. And Andy serves as one of our test development managers. So we're going to start with Andy. Yep. Okay. Good morning. What we're going to walk through today as I start is I'm going to introduce a few things about the Smarter Balance Consortium. A lot of the things I'm sure uh, may be familiar, but it's going to set the table to as we walk through um, some of the things we're doing to transition our assessment system uh, into what Linda and Greg are going to walk us through, how uh, their team is supporting the implementation of the Common Core, and then we're going to get to some of those Smarter Balance items. The assessment challenge uh, that we have in Michigan is you know, we've adopted the Common Core state standards, as we all know, uh, for career and college readiness. And we want to get to the place where all of our students leave high school, career, and college ready. And what we are trying to figure out is what can we do with an assessment system to best help 
that cause and the best way to support uh, our students as we move ahead. Uh, this may be familiar. The Smarter Balance uh, Assessment Consortium has 25 states currently in it. Uh, the green ones are governing states. The blue ones are advisory states. Um, perhaps since the last time folks have seen this, there are more green states than blue states. That's a good thing. Um, it represents 40% of the K-12 population. Um, Washington State is the fiscal agent, which means they take care of the, the finances for the consortium, and then West Ed out of California also provides our project management support services for us. <coughs> this graphic uh, displays a balanced assessment system that we like to work with, with the assessment consortium. There's a few pieces here. On the, on the left is where we started in the previous slide. You know, we have the Common Core State Standards for Career and College Readiness, and on the right, the goal of having high school students leave career and college ready. Mm -hmm. At the top, where it says summative assessments, that's what we have had, um, more or less with our MEEP and MME tests. We have had our summative assessments there to measure growth for our students. And on the bottom are some new tools that are going to be coming with the assessment consortium. The formative assessment practices is going to be an online tool set that educators are going to be able to use to improve their education. This will contain formative assessment practices, PD materials, and other resources for them. And SMART is also going to be putting in an interim assessment uh, system as well, which will be you know, flexible, optional assessments that educators will be able to use to benchmark their progress throughout the year uh, as they get to the goal of being able to be successful in the summative test. <coughs> and uh, <coughs> the SMART system will be uh, beginning in the 2014-15 school year. So the spring of 15 is the first time that students will be taking that assessment. What do we do between now and then? A short update of how VA is working to transition our assessments as we move towards the, uh, the Smart Up Assessment System. Right now, schools are supposed to be using the Math and ELA Career and College Ready Standards, the Common Core. For science and social studies, those assessments are still based on the grade level content expectations and the high school content expectations because those are still our currently adopted standards. But something we have to deal with is our different schools and districts are in different places. Um, the speed at which our schools adopt these standards and get them into full implementation is different uh, from place to place, so that really produces an assessment challenge for us because we need to make a measurement tool that works for everybody at the same time. So this year, in 2012, our MEET test was still based on the grade level content expectations. Science and social studies, there was no change there since our standards are the same. And for the math and ELA assessments, uh, our office worked to remove or replace expectations that aren't any longer applicable based on the Common Core state standards. So any standards that aren't overlapped with the Common Core, we were able to remove those. And some of the standards that may have shifted a grade, we were able to uh, take those into account and make adjustments so that our MEEP test would be able to be uh, used by both the school that's still more or less working with the grade level content expectations, but also be useful for, for a school that has full implementation of the Common Core. In 2013, the MME is still based on the high school content expectations. Uh, for high school, there aren't as many adjustments uh, to the assessment that we had to make uh, for the MEEP test. And this provides a way to, for us to have a valid assessment for all mission schools, uh, regardless of where they are in the process of implementation of the Common Core. <clears throat> a quick assessment timeline, like I said, 2012 assessments uh, are based on the GLCEs and the HSCEs. In 2013, something we're going to start working to do is start uh, embedding field test items that are based on the Common Core. These are going to be items that are new in the Common Core that weren't in the grade level content expectations. An example of that is starting to wrap back in some persuasive writing uh, into our assessments. We used to have that, it went away, and now it's coming back in the Common Core. And in the 14-15 school year, that's when we're going to transition into the Smarter Balance Assessment Consortium. And science and social studies will still remain in a lot of ways similar to as they are now. Uh, and that's when also when we will move to spring-based assessments. I'm going to hand it over to Linda to start up their piece. As you know, uh, when we've been with you before, we have been working on implementing the Common Core State Standards, and as we move to these new assessments, we thought it might be helpful to remind you of some of the steps we're taking in order to help schools be ready 
and teachers to be ready for this implementation. One of the first things, rather than looking at the standards today, I thought I'd ask you to take a, a look at some of the other skills that students need in order to be career and college ready because we can teach them finite pieces of information. We can bring that all together, but we really need students to be skilled in some very 21st century kinds of things. So one of the first ones is the use of technology and tools strategically in learning and in communicating. How can students communicate other than on Facebook and on their tweets? And how can they use technology to uh, research and bring into their knowledge base things that they need for their reports and their work? The ability to use argument and reasoning to do research, to construct arguments, and to critique the reasoning of others. A lot of what you'll see in these uh, Smarter Balance assessment pieces will be the challenge to students to be able to construct an argument and reason against what their argument might be. Communicate and collaborate, correct, sure. Collaborate effectively uh, to a variety of audiences. What we hear from the business community repeatedly is that they are not getting um, students who are prepared to work in the, in the uh, business world in a collaborative way. They don't know how to work in teams and they don't know how to communicate their needs. And finally, to solve problems and construct uh, something in a new world. So if you've had this problem before and now you're getting a new problem, what can you pull from the past and what new sorts of information do you need to bring together in order to solve a current problem? So these are four constructs that we're looking at across the curriculum as we move ahead. Greg will, will work, walk through with you the areas of focus that we're going to be dealing with in, the, um, in this presentation. There are three that we're working on in, in curriculum instruction. The first is instruction. Nothing happens to and change what's going on more than the good instruction. And so what's happening in that classroom between the information, the teacher, and the <coughs> And that next is networking. One of the positive points of the Common Core State Standards is that we're able to utilize a lot of material that comes from other states, so we don't have to do it all our, ourselves. And we've got great support also from the ISDs in this, and Greg will share that with you. And then innovation. What can we do that's different and new? And so Greg's been working closely with our new staff on all of this. And when I say new, it's only that we've done replacements, not that we've had lots of new staff added. So Greg, I'll turn over to you. Um, in, in terms of support uh, for the implementation of instruction, um, we focused around the areas indicated here. Um, and, and this is the, the crux of the new team. The first being the um, integration. Um, so the integration of arts into instruction, for example. Uh, the second piece there being the intervention component, which is our multi-tiered systems of support and RTI, or response to intervention. Um, we're looking at literacy across multiple content areas and also being deliberate about paying attention to um, low socioeconomic status um, situations. And then the final component here um, of alternative education looks at <coughs> flexible systems um, that make sense for students um, typically outside the walls of the traditional classroom but also a blend of those. Um, in terms of some of the early on support, um, we do have crosswalk documents um, that have been available that crosswalk the Common Core State Standards with the high school content expectations as well as the grade level content expectations. Um, we did rollout sessions around the state on the new standards. We're currently working on a video series, and um, actually Bobby Joe has been working with us on that, but we've been working with our state partners, um, the um, state um, teacher professional organizations, the MEA and the AFT, along with our um, administrative organizations and MAISA to put these together, um, and really to focus on instruction and what that instruction looks like for implementation of the Common Core. And then the last component here is the Big Ideas okay. document. And um, what we've done here is we've worked um, closely with the School Improvement Office to try to embed this into the process. And these are models for implementation. And these are models that a district and or building could use um, within their professional learning communities to target the improvement instruction that they want to make with their ultimate goal, again, of career and college readiness. <clears throat> Linda had mentioned the, um, the, the advantage of the networking, and here are some examples. On the national um, stage, we're working with um, these partners, among others, but um, Achieve, for example, has created a 
um, a rubric that allows districts and buildings to actually evaluate and align their materials to the Common Core State Standards. Um, the Chief Counsel of State School Officers um, has been a, a really good partner around implementation and provided a lot of really good resources um, for us to benefit from from the other states involved. And then two pieces that we're working with on the common or on the college board, excuse me, um, one being this common understanding of what's career and college ready between the K-12 system and the colleges. And then um, the second piece there is um, increasing access to advanced placement. This is an initiative that's specific to STEM for underrepresented um, females and minorities. In terms of state networking, um, we are working very closely with MAISA. Um, we attend their general education leadership um, network meetings. Um, we're also working closely with them on the implementation of the math and ELA curriculum model units um, that have been under development. And um, also, again, as far as getting that out to the field, working closely with the professional development work group. On the innovation side, this is kind of where we look at, um, again, overall flexibility, but some options for earning credit. Um, so we've been working with the field on, on these initiatives, um, seat time waivers, dual enrollment, and early middle colleges, um, which we work closely with the CTE office on. Um, considering the local flexibility that's currently available um, for districts to meet the standards, the personal curriculum option, um, choice in terms of um, providing um, coursework that's relevant for students within the system and then also uh, public school academies. So what we've done to bring all this together um, is we've created a career and college ready portal. Um, the web address is on the screen. It's uh, michigancr.org. Um, but this is essentially a, a one-stop shop. And you'll see on the screen there, this is just a screenshot. Um, we've organized implementation around the um, topics at the top there. Um, and for example, when you dig into it, if you were to click on that um, balanced assessment tab, it would give you some options, one being the um, summative assessment. And that portal actually takes you right to the site. For example, here, the Smarter Balanced um, site. So it's a direct link. And um, the sample items are on that site. And so um, I will turn it back over to Andy to talk a little more in depth about the sample items. Great. This is the part that I know, you know I'm most excited about. And I know the colleagues that I work with um, in the item development work group for Smarter are very excited about because this is a chance that after a year and a half, two years, we have some examples that we can show people and they can get an idea of what is coming up because for so long they knew the assessment consortium was coming, but they didn't necessarily know what it was about or what it would look like. Uh, so in early October, there was a release of an online tool holding 50 plus sample items. Uh, these items had math items, ELA items, and then we were able to put out some samples from all seven grades that will be in the assessment system. This is the first chance, one of the most recently asked questions that I got before we got these out there is, you know, what kind of types of items will there be? Will there be different types? What will it look like? Is it going to be the same old multiple choice item that we're used to? I would always say no, but now I can finally show people what exactly is going to be happening. And it also has an opportunity for us to really display the new level of rigor uh, that's going to be expected by the Common Core State Standards and it's going to be part of the Smarter System. This is one of the sample items that's out there on the Smarter Balance site. You know, Greg, you know, alluded to the link on the Career and College Ready Portal that will take you there. And the web address is also on the end of the presentation, but these are easily accessible. This is one of the sample items just to talk about that uh, displays a math item. And it's an example of technology already being placed in uh, the items that are going to be part of the assessment. This is an item that gives the student the stem of the question, asks them what you know, they need to figure out. But in this sample, they have to drag and drop those bottles into these grocery bags to be able to solve the different problems. So that's one already improved area of uh, technology being embedded into these items that's going to take uh, these assessment levels into the next uh, century really here. Um, to add that technology component. 
each one of the sample items. So, and excuse me, mm -hmm. these aren't live, but if the board members wanted to see them live and actually drag the bottles into the bags, if they go to this, if you go to mm -hmm. the sample, right. mm -hmm. you'll actually be able to move things and manipulate. And can you move it back out? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah, mm -hmm. if you, yes, if you change right. your mind. You can move things in and out and, you know, uh, this is the best we could do on a PowerPoint, but absolutely right. When we go out to that website, almost every one of the items involves some sort of new technology with the computer that you're able to work with. Each sample item that's out there in this data set has an information pop-up that's out there that gives you the information that ties up to the question. For example, for that question we were just looking at, it's a grade four. Uh, it's dealing with problem solving. It lays the common core state standard core, right, core uh, standard right there, and it also gives an explanation of what we're trying to ask the students to do with this question. I believe in your packets you have some full-size uh, handouts uh, that I want to make sure to mention that, that Phil Chase from our composition unit did a lot of hard work putting together these samples uh, for us, so he's here, so I want to be sure to thank him for his hard work doing that. Wave um, your hand so we all can <laughs> <laughs> get the rest of it. Thank so, you, Phil. Yep. This is a really a great opportunity for us to look at what would an old MEEP item look like and how might a similar item on the Smarter Balance Assessment work. Um, so it really is able for us to look at it and see how far we've come from the way we've always done things to how we're going to be doing things. The first item here for the MEEP example, this is a, an item that deals with fractions on a number line. It simply asks you, asks you to look at the number line and select the correct answer. That's what we've been used to, that's what we've been doing for so long in our assessments. The similar question here on the Smarter Balance sample item is talking about similar concepts, but it adds a lot more depth and understanding in it. In this example, a student has to look uh, at the number line on the left, and then I compare it to the additional number lines on the right, and then click a yes or no box to it. Um, this is a new way that we can add a lot more rigor uh, to even a third grade assessment here uh, where a student can have more in-depth thinking and, and, and working knowledge to be able to compare the two against each other. This is a sample high school math item from our MME exam. <coughs> this, is just asking, this item is just asking our students you know, to look at the expression and convert it into the rational form. So a student's going to have a scratch piece of paper, do their work, and then select the right answer. This item right here is talking about a similar concept, but is taking it to a whole other level, and it's also adding <coughs> some new components to it. This item right here if you look down in the pop-up box down on the bottom right where it says the rationals and radicals, that's the information pop-up that I mentioned earlier that each item will have. This item is actually assessing two different content standards. If you look down there on the Common Core State Standards there, there's two there. So some, uh, some ways these new technology-based items can really benefit us is that we're able to tackle multiple things with one item. So it really adds some efficiency to being able to gather that information we need on the student's ability level. But in this question, there's multiple steps involved. Again, a student is asked to drag and drop the expressions that are in that middle column and put them into those boxes onto the right that, if you look at the first one, for example, pull three unique expressions whose sum is less than 10. So there's two different steps the student's asked to do here. One as they'd had to do in the MME item, they have to simplify the expression, but then they also have to be able to add them together to see if they're equal or less to, than 10, like it's asking. So those are the two steps that are involved in it. A reading sample item. This is an elementary school reading item. This item is simply a reading comprehension item. It says, read the sentence below. In this sentence, the word joint means, and then you select your correct answer. This is an item from Smarter Balance, the sample data set, that's getting at a similar idea. But again, this item is assessing two different standards, so you're making this item more robust and rich in itself. <coughs> 
but what this item is doing is it's asking the student to know what scarred means. So that's the reading comprehension piece. But then they also have to identify the context in the reading passage that lets them know what the word scarred means. And in, I like this sample question because one way that uh, this is different than what we're used to in our paper-based paper -based tests is that reading passage is going to pop up and the student actually selects the text in that reading passage that tells, that gives them the context they need to know to answer that question. So they're actually able to work inside that context and that's how the item is recorded. They click in the context and then they hit the next button and they move on. They're not just highlighting it and then selecting the text down below in a multiple choice screen. The other new piece of uh, what Smarter Balance is going to be doing is we're going to be adding these performance tasks uh, to the assessment that we'll be giving to students. This is a brand new item type from Michigan. This is the way we're going to be able to measure concepts that are uh, usual assessments aren't able to cover very well. And a great example of that is research questions. How do we uh, assess whether a student is figuring out how to go do good research with a multiple choice question? We really can't. So that's one of the areas that these performance tasks will be able to deal with. Uh, they'll take up to an estimated 125 minutes of time. Uh, the performance task may include a classroom activity. Uh, and on that data set on the website, there's six sample performance tasks out there for folks to look at. Um, and it gives uh, the person or the educator looking at the, the sample performance task, the teacher prep and resources needed to look at it. Uh, it gives them the specifications for it and then scoring rubrics uh, that will be uh, tied right to that performance task. So educators can actually try this out in their classroom and then be able to score it and see how their classroom did. So those are some of the sample items and some comparisons against the items that are similar to what we've been doing. I know Greg pointed it out earlier, but here's the Smarter Balance website. Uh, and on there, if you, if you click on it, there's a link for sample items that are new and, and coming out. Um, and it really is a, a fairly easy user interface to walk through and you're able to see some of the things uh, that we talked about. Uh, there's some other technology items that we couldn't do on a PowerPoint because some of them have animations and video uh, and audio. Uh, and it's really neat to look at where we're going with our item types and with the Smarter Balance system. <laughs> thank you. I appreciate your time. Great. Thank you. Mike? Nancy, please. <clears throat> you have on some of your sample items. Oh, wait. No. I'm sorry. Go ahead. Sorry. No, we're, we're <laughs> <laughs> um, on some of your sample items, you uh -huh. have multiple content expectations that are, that are um, in one question. Mm -hmm. Are they written or is it possible to write or to discern if a child can has one of those concepts but not the other? With some items, yes, and, and some, no. Depending on uh, the item, some of them can have different scoring rubrics that you're able to uh, you know, identify. Yes, the student was able to simplify the expression using that math one, but no, they weren't able to order them uh, in a way to find out if they were uh, less than 10 or not. Um, so it depends on the item and the, and the scoring model that's put together for those items. Some will be simply a yes or no, and some will be a, you know, a more uh, partial credit model possibly where you're able to get different point values. And of course the reason why I ask that is because if, as an educator, it, it would be imperative for me to be able to identify what it is my student does know or doesn't know right. so that I can then go about making necessary adjustments or changes or additional time or more time on task for an individual. And so um, are there perhaps other questions then that if that you could then get at if, if it was not clear which if any of those concepts were being a, were, were mastered by a student to determine whether or not um, I need to go and look at all of these things again or maybe just this one? Is that, I mean, I may be asking for the sun, moon, and stars, I don't know, um, but I'm just curious. Right, I mean, there's some of that that we haven't figured out yet for Smarter okay. Balance, but since it's going to be an adaptive uh, assessment, uh, it's quite reasonable as we put together uh, you know, a test form uh, that if a student had that question that had two expectations in that high school math item and they got it incorrect, um, it's possible 
maybe the system could shoot them a question that's just based on More you know, the adding more expressions. Mm -hmm. Yeah. I, I, I'm just trying to I'm trying to think through mm -hmm. as a classroom teacher how would I how would I adjust to this? What what changes would I make if necessary? And so um, because we have this wonderful I, by the way I think this is great. Um, I want to go and use it right now. <laughs> um, it's hard. It's exciting. Yeah. It is hard. It is hard. But you know, it, even even in the um, small time that I work each week with students, I see how these concepts and how these um, how these expectations are so critical to their success. And so to be able to have something that's interactive, um, it, it, when you get to paper and pencil with them only, you've lost them mm -hmm. by and large today. And so if you can do something that's interactive like this, now it becomes relevant to them. And you've tapped into their curiosity of, can I do this? Mm -hmm. um, and so I, I really, really am excited about this. But I also think about, okay, how am I going to use that? Mm -hmm. So uh, this is this is very exciting. I have other questions, but I'm wait. I'm happy to wait for others to, to ask theirs. Okay, Cassandra's one. Um, thanks. Just a quick question. First of all, thank you for um, the presentation today. I think it's really helpful for us to be able to see these uh, in real form as well. My question, though, is, um, and we've we've asked this before, and. I think we'll continue to ask it for the next year and a half, is what percentage of our schools right now have the ability to do an online assessment? We're um, finding that out as we go ahead. 94% of our schools have responded to, um, to a, a, a sub survey um, asking them where they are in the process. We have a better handle today on that, but I will tell you that right now we're not ready, and that is exactly why we have the, um, the we're delighted to have the $50 million that we can put toward uh, getting our schools and our districts in a position where we can go to online assessments. Uh, too many of them are using uh, standard computer labs and not, don't have the capacity for each student to have something, and too many of them have old software. So those are two pieces we've got to address. We also don't have the capacity right now to move everything all around the state, and we need that as well. And we're still offering, obviously, both options for districts that don't have the technology. Correct. Yes. Yeah. Yes. The, the test is the test is available on paper, pencil for up to three years. Three years. Mm -hmm. <laughs> Just to follow up with that, for the schools that have, say, one or two uh, computer labs, and that's essentially the access that they have. How much time do they have to assess each student? Yeah, for, for the Smarter Balance system, when we get there, it's going to be a 12-week window okay. where schools are able to assess things. Okay. Uh, so that'll be true with the Smarter Balance system, and we're also working to move our other assessments online, too, and it'll be a similar situation where it's not the uh, Tuesday of the 3rd of March is the day to do everything. It's going to be a window. Also remember, what's it in the three years? If that takes us out to 2017, 2017-18, really for folks to get caught up. And our hope is that if we do a good job uh, in the minds of appropriators, the way that we use the 50 million dollars, then our hope is every year they're going to at least allocate that amount, if not more. And understanding the same problem that Cassandra is bringing up. I mean, if they don't, our kids aren't going to be ready. The districts won't be ready. So we have a couple of years here to really gear up with the right technology, I think. Okay, John, please. Um, well, thank you for your hard work on this, and thank you for the presentation. Um, it is encouraging. Um, and Dan and Marianne and Kathy, uh, we were doing item E just about, obviously, in anticipation of your arrival. We can restart at the beginning. Um, but I just wanted to reassure myself and on this point, which I think we'll talk about too later, uh, we very much want to make sure no matter where or how learning is delivered that we're able to use the assessment that is the right gauge of whether young people are making progress on our college career ready standards and our state standards. So these assessments that you're illustrating, uh, are they going to be used, able to be used by 
traditional schools, whether you're taking a course across town at a charter, whether you're taking it on an online modality, uh, will these assessments be able to be used by all delivery modalities? Absolutely. I, I believe that they will. I think that ties directly into, you know, the, the new vision we have with, uh, you know, some of those schooling situations you talk about and uh, the, the new vision of us having these online assessments being available and, you know, to all those kids. I absolutely think it will take care of that. Thank you. And, John, you know, implicit in your question, too, is, is when you think about from now until 2017, if we went back the same number of years, we wouldn't have had any idea there would be an iPad or probably even an iPhone. So it would be interesting to, to try to even anticipate what that may look like for kids to have options on and how cheap that's probably going to be. If you look at Moore's Law about twice the capacity half the price every year. Nancy, we're going to go deep. Oh, great. Um, one of the One of my major concerns about any assessment system is how useful is it not only to the educators who are in charge of imparting that knowledge to the young people to find out where they are and what needs yet to be done, but how useful will this be to parents and students so that they can on their <laughs> own understand and follow and track their students' progress or what I need to do yet. Um, is that with this 12-week window, it seems to me now you're actually opening more of that possibility available to you. But what will be the data system that will allow parents and students to be able to understand that better? We, we don't know. I mean, the reporting aspect of the Smarter Balance uh, system has not been figured out yet. Okay. Um, they're in the process of starting that process. But I think... Um, since it's going to be computer-based, we're going to be able to have a lot more opportunity for different reports to go out to families as well as the educators themselves. I think, I think as you go forward in trying to figure that out, I would encourage you to really look at the um, end user of this and how this can affect them as well. We're asking young people to look at multiple ways in, in multiple possible settings to educate themselves to get the best education possible for college and career ready. I think it would be, it would be um, um, too bad if we didn't also have our assessments mimic that. And so uh, I would encourage you to think about how can we make this, um, I, how can we make this system usable by both students and parents and educators to make certain that we've got the best remedies possible and the best celebrations possible for what is being done. So I would ask that. And then the next question I have on your, and this wasn't, I can't remember who was doing this portion of it. Um, you were talking about uh, the changes from our current meet system, our great current great, um, grade level content expectations and high school content expectations to the core, to the new common core. And you said that there we, that, if, that you are looking to remove or replace expectations that are no longer applicable, and the ones that you would replace, you mentioned, might be shifted from grade to grade, or course to course, perhaps I don't know. Um, <coughs> excuse me. Is are there actually new content expectations that don't exist anywhere within our current uh, grade level or um, course level content expectations? Well, there's, I think there's two answers. I mean, there's two parts to what you asked, and I, there's, there's two answers. One, okay. what we had to do is uh, we were able to work with um, my content staff and the staff from Linda's office to, um, you know, compare the, the GLCEs to the Common Core standards, and we were able to come up with where the overlap is between the two. Mm -hmm. So th those are the, the expectations that we're able to just leave alone. Uh, there are some... Uh, for example, that just went away looking at the Common Core. Uh, one of those examples is uh, some of the statistics uh, standards that are in our GLCEs in the middle school aren't in the Common Core at all. So we just took those out of the test. We can't, we can't assess those because there may be right. some schools that are Common Core based that wouldn't have taught that. 
Uh, when I talked about shifting, it's not that those statistics were going to shift to a different grade, but there are some standards that moved up or down a grade level uh, that if a standard moved up a grade level, we had to take it out because a student would not have received that content yet um, if they were a common core based school. So when would they be assessed on that? Um, they would be assessed the following year. Oh, okay. So it essence. isn't that they're just never going to be assessed on it. Right? Right. Okay. They shifted from one grade to another. Yeah, that. that's what right. I thought. Yeah. yeah. There are a very few areas where it gets it gets fuzzy like that, but they, they get it one way or another eventually, yes. And, and here's the reason why I ask this. One of the common um, uh, complaints or concerns about Common Core is that we will be giving up our high standards in order to meet the Common Core of the nation. I don't agree with that, but I want to hear it, <coughs> that, that, that either I am right or wrong, which I will take whichever, but I, I'd like to have you address that. When we did the crosswalk, we found that we had great uh, commonality between the two and that we were not going to be losing anything. In fact, the rigor will step up the expectation of students. It, uh, the content may be the same, but now we're raising the bar. Thank you. I think that is the fault of what I... Oh, I know. I have one other, um, one other question. Um, under your national networking, you talk about um, all the different places that are helping you uh, uh, work with this. This may or may not have anything to do with Common Core, but and, as the, and the assessment, I'm hoping it will. I'm hoping that through your assessment, it will kind of nudge people on. One of the biggest um, concerns I've had about advanced placement is the really broad range of quality that you see in, in, in uh, advanced placement from one school to another, from one district to another, from one state to another. And everyone says, well, but you have to take the same tests. Well, but we have a lot of people who have what they call advanced placement classes who kids can opt out of ever taking the test. And if that's true, it seems to me that you don't have a common quality throughout those classes. Will, will this Common Core assessment address that in any way to kind of urge districts and schools to make certain that there is a high quality level within the classes they call advanced placement? I think so. I mean, it's, it's looking um, <coughs> the depth and rigor involved in especially the high school smarter balance items mm -hmm. uh, is for sure there. You know, even in that one example I, I showed where a, a student has to simplify expressions and rank them and order them and add them up, um, you know, that's definitely getting into that, that higher level of thinking and understanding uh, that's going to be required in advanced classes and, you know, for our career and college readiness that we're looking for. The, the reason I ask this is that I have too often heard, as you know, advanced placement is looked at, uh, looked upon by colleges as something that's an indicator of whether or not a student is ready to go into this school or that school, uh, whether or not they're ready to comp out, comp out, not comp out, sorry, <laughs> comp out of this class or another. And I've heard too often from both kids going to college that have been in advanced placement or from people in colleges reflecting upon students' advanced placement classes that if you took an advanced placement class, why don't you understand these concepts? Why don't you have this down? Because that should be an advanced placement. And clearly you did not learn that there. And, well, and so that concerns me. I think you're asking two questions. One is the quality and the and having less variability among advanced placement classes. And that's something that we can work with College Board on because they, they take that very seriously. Yeah. And they do intensive training to make sure that that quality is maintained. So if you're hearing those, that kind of variability, then we should be probably talking to the College Board to see how they can help us to make sure that we get yeah, rid of that I, variability. I would, I would encourage you to do that because yeah. I know that conversation is out there. Yeah. As to whether or not the, the new assessments will be testing advanced placement level work, I think what yeah. you're hearing, again, because this is an adaptive test, for some students it could continue to rank up the rigor. If, if a student is able to get this answer, they go to the next level and the next level. Okay. I don't think, as far as I know, I don't think SBAC has actually done any kind of comparison, but it certainly gives a whole lot of latitude 
within that range of the adapted test. Okay, thank you very much. I appreciate it. <laughs> Richard, go ahead. The, um, <laughs> the MEEP test was, had kind of a dual function. One was to assess students, so students were measured against uh, it was a criterion reference test, so students were me measured against a series of goals, and one of the frustrations of the MEEP test is that the goals kept changing every year, so scores really were not comparable from one year to another, although we, we kept doing it. And the other thing was the aggregate scores uh, were used to assess and evaluate uh, schools and school districts. Is that the same? Uh, are we going to are we going to use the uh, the smarter balance tests in the same uh, dual for the same dual purpose, or is there going to be any shift in emphasis here? Is it going to be more? Um, uh, or will will we continue to use it as both a measure of individual student growth and an evaluation of school and district performance? Uh, the answer would be yes. It will still be used for individual, and we will then start to ta aggregate that to get a school. Okay. All right. Kathleen, Dan, please. Welcome. You may have answered this already, so I'm, so I'm sorry. But what plans are in the works, or are you doing already, training of teachers <coughs> to use this? this we we did discuss that, but Linda, you want to give another? I, I think if you'll take a look on um, page, uh, slides 10 through um, about 14 or 15, but in the brief answer, we're working with a network of both national network as well as the state network. MAISA is preparing unit level um, instructional units for the, for teachers across the grade levels. We're working with a video series that's going to go live in January in order to reach the teachers. Uh, we're working with national organizations as well in order to help us, help mm -hmm. others. And so our goal is to get this out to the classrooms because, as, as Andy said at the beginning, this is to be implemented this year at the latest and yeah. move forward from there. So we've got a lot. It's going to be a big help to the teachers now to see what some of the items look like. It'll give them a better uh -huh. sense of what we meant by this wording and this standard. Okay. Thank you. Thank you, Stan. Good morning. Um, I, so, as we think about um, uh, assessment uh, across the state, we um, one of the things that comes to mind for me is um, kind of some of the basic capacities that a student has to have in order to take the assessment, um, and. So I think historically we've talked about things like time management um, and the like. We're obviously adding another level of capacities that have to be uh, owned by a student in order to take this assessment. So um, there are instructions uh, on these questions like drag or click or select or obviously typing skills will matter a little bit. Um, what kind of guidance, if any, is being given to schools about what computer-related skills students need to have mastered in order to effectively take the assessment at each grade level? Uh, we're, we're working on that, and that's the, that's the closest answer I can give you right now. We are embedding, for instance, in the video series, some of the components that would say to a teacher, now, as you're teaching this, here's some things to think about for the technology that a student needs to have mastered in order to um, be able to get into this curriculum and, and learn it. Here are some ways to think about teaching this so that you bring uh, the online components into your, into your lessons so that students use this in an everyday world and they're comfortable with you working on a computer as much as they are on a piece of paper. Um, so we're beginning to get that across to classrooms and to teachers through the video series and through our presentations that we're making in various conferences. Quick follow-up, has the consortium provided guidance to states on this? So at, at you know, uh, typing becomes a part of this exam, say, in seventh grade, and so at seventh grade, your students probably will be disadvantaged if they've not taken typing or, you know, that kind of, is, is that kind of guidance coming from the consortium at all to states? I don't think we've given that type of guidance out yet. That's an important thing for me to take back and, and let people know that we should uh, 
uh, make sure we address some of those things or even put out some sort of a, con a continuum of, of skills that might be needed throughout the grade levels. You know, I would add that with the smarter test or any of these online assessments, there's always going to be a chance for uh, students and the teachers to take uh, practice tests uh, and have uh, samples where students can uh, try out and practice some of those skills needed for the assessment, dragging and dropping or, or clicking and things like that. So those tools will be out there as well uh, for students and teachers to use in their classrooms preparing themselves. But I think that's a good thing for us to take back for them to consider. A continuum like you just said, that would be a, a great help for teachers. Good questions, Nancy. I'm just going to follow up a bit on what Dan just said. As we started going into <laughs> online classes for the very first time back in, I don't know what it was, 90s of some sort, <laughs> um, that was one of the things that we needed to assess very, very carefully was what is it that are the basic skills that, that people need to be able to do, like like how do you get to a website, how do you how do you click on something that you didn't realize was a link but is, and all of that. And I think that this is the new generation of what are the very, very basics of tools that you need to do online assessments. And so I'm glad, Dan, that you asked that because I think that will be critical to the success of this ability for our students to be able to do this. Yeah, I mean, I think, and to add to that, as I've often talked about our preschool grandkids and their use of technology, we have to remember that's not what lots of kids have exposure to. They're not, they're not in that mindset yet. I think they will more and more as we get the four-year-olds in, if we can get the funding this year for, for, for especially poor rural and urban kids on the funding for early childhood, that can pick up and start to catch up then. But otherwise, good points. Well, I think, I think what they're not used to, in addition to what you're talking about, the educators not being used to it, children are used to working with technology. It's second nature to them. What they're not used to is working with education technology. I run into that all the time. I can, I've got kids who can run races around anybody and playing games on their technology. But if you ask them to do research on the piece of technology, that's a whole different ballgame. So those are the concepts that, that I think we really need to carefully think about, about how is it that children are using technology today versus how is it we want them to use it on our assessments. Ms. Eileen? Yes, Eileen. Um, uh, so the National Assessment Governing Board has been moving toward computer-based assessment for quite some time based solidly on research on how much kids are doing in schools. What Nancy is discussing is the thing that terrifies all of us, which is the availability of, of uh, uh, computer-based instruction for kids and grand students who are in a poor district. And that could be rural or uh, urban. Um, I don't know how bad the problem is in the suburban area, but certainly from what we saw, uh, what we've seen already, um, I think that's the issue of the places. I can tell you that the research shows a pretty heavy penetration of digital learning um, uh, familiarity across the country. Uh, I don't know what we should
I think we'll take a look at it and see if we can direct you to where they are. I guess I want to uh, urge my fellow board members and, and all others here present not to take um, assessment testing out of, uh, see it out of perspective. First off, in terms of uh, computer-based assessive uh, assessment, uh, both uh, summative and uh, cumulative, uh, all of the charter schools of CMU uh, and I think most, if not all, of the charter schools in Michigan have been practicing this for the last eight years. So, and, and many of their schools, a high proportion of them are in urban and rural areas, so uh, I'm, I'm sure that the, the, this, the, that the Michigan public schools will be able to meet this challenge in, uh, when they give it uh, appropriate uh, priority. Uh, second, uh, an assessment tool is like the ruler you use to measure height. You know, it, it, we're going from uh, a common standard uh, customary measurements to metric measurements in, in some respects uh, that might give us a more accurate measure. Some of the issues we're arguing about is whether you measure with your shoes on or off, whether you measure the top of the hair or the top of the skull, and that will affect your score. But it doesn't have anything to do with the growth that we mean to foster. And the real chance, and, and I guess what I'm saying is that schools that attempt to teach to the test and put too much emphasis on point and click skills and other uh, things that are peripheral often miss the bigger issue of, um, uh, of delivering a good education, which will then be reflected in whatever test you take, whether, whether there are some items or in the curriculum or not. I, and I think the public needs to understand that uh, the Common Core, the, the Michigan Curricula Framework, uh, and other curricula that are out there, 85 to 95 percent of the stuff, the content, is the same. So if you've got a good education in Indiana with a different curriculum, you're going to test pretty well on the Michigan's MEEP standards because 85 to 95 percent of the items are the same. And the real challenge for all of our schools is to deliver good education. And I would hate to see assessment become a distraction <coughs> rather than simply a tool for measuring that, that growth there. Good point. Marianne. Um, excuse me if uh, you already discussed this. But I'd like to follow up on what Eileen said. And uh, are we making efforts? to make sure that all children have the necessary tools for uh, studying and taking uh, the test? I think that the, um, the answer to that is yes. We are working through, especially uh, <coughs> through the grant that was provided by the legislature of $50 million this year to utilize uh, in order to help increase the ability of schools across the state to be able to deliver um, uh, online education and instruction so to be prepared for online assessments. Ninety-four percent of the schools in Michigan completed that assessment this fall mm -hmm. and um, so we'll be moving ahead and, and working with the information we got out of that assessment in order to see where the next steps might need to be taken. Good. Thank you. Well, thanks for accommodating the change in time a little bit, and I appreciate your, your time. We're going to go back and kind of, with the quorum now, we'll be able to get to two and appreciate your stopping by here. You'll see why in a minute, because we want to be able to, while Carolyn Curtin's here, if I may just call attention to that. First of all, welcome back, Carolyn. We appreciate seeing you again. And we wanted to make sure that uh, we, we got some recognition in for our, our uh, two board members that will be leaving while Carolyn's here because she's not able to stay the whole day. Um, we're also going to have a reception at the end of the day, but I'll get to that in a moment. The first item is approval of agenda and order of priority. Um, <coughs> moved by John, supported by Cassandra. Any further discussion? All in favor, aye. Aye. Thank you. Mertz. Good morning. I'd like to introduce the people seated at the table. To my immediate left is Mike Flanagan. He's the state superintendent and chairman of the board. 
To his left is John Austin, President of the Board, who resides in Ann Arbor. Then Cassandra Albrich, Vice President of the Board. She resides in Rochester Hills. Nancy Danhoff from East Lansing, the Board Secretary. Kathleen Strauss from Detroit, member of the board, and next to her is Michigan Teacher of the Year, Bobby Joe Kenyon. When Bobby's not seated at the board table, she's teaching high school science and math at West Ottawa High School, which is part of Grand Rapids, Grand Rapids Public School. And across the table, um, usually seated in that seat, is Greg Tedder. He represents the governor. And <coughs> next, the next seat as you come around the table is Eileen Weiser. You've heard Eileen Weiser on the phone. She resides in Ann Arbor. And then Dan Varner. Dan Varner is from Detroit. And then Richard Ziley, who lives in Dearborn. He's the board's association delegate to the National Association of State Boards of Education. Next to me is Marianne Yard McGuire, the board's treasurer. She resides in Detroit. Thank you. Well, I've written some notes here because I want to, these are two people I really have come to admire and I've come to uh, consider as friends. And I wanted to just start out, first of all, with the reason I think your service uh, as, a, as a state board member is so appreciated. It starts, this is just my symbolism of it, but it starts with this, with most of us. I look for every shameless chance to get my free grandkids in here. Uh, by the way, Will looks, that's our one-year-old Will, and he looks like E.T. did between the stuffed toys, if you remember that movie. <laughs> so Avery's on the left. And, but I, the reason I want to show that is I think people don't appreciate in our general public enough the important work done at this table. And I think the combination of uh, policy and actually running a department, I mean, I think often they don't realize that your actions here actually translate to running a massive department that has implications every day. And then, of course, the important policy things that the board develops are so uh, important to the, a lot of the debates we're having today. So, and so for in both Nancy Danhoff and Marianne, uh, McGuire's case. Marianne served on the board for 16 years. <coughs> Nancy's been on the board for eight years. And by the way, for those that can stay at the end of the board meeting today, there'll be a reception and there's invited guests and, and we're hoping everyone can join us. Um, and I want to say this, I thought we'd start a new tradition where January 1, I saw Lupe earlier and, uh, oh, there she, and Michelle, and their pictures will go outside. But I thought what we would start given the starkness and, and maybe the appropriate legacy of board members is that we would take the pictures of past board members when we can find it, but certainly these two uh, tremendous board members who served the, the kids and the state so well and start a section of this area where we move their <coughs> pictures from the front to the inside of the boardroom as a legacy and really thank you for being here. Right, you can choose new pictures if you'd like, but we like the ones <laughs> that are out there. Um, and we're really grateful for the service the board members have provided. They each brought their own professional and personal perspectives to the board table. And what I really thought is so needed at this time at the national and state level is they've done it in a, in a respectful, collaborative way, Republicans and Democrats working together. And that doesn't mean the vote's going to be 8-0. The vote probably shouldn't be 8-0 on a lot of issues. But it's still done in a, in a civil discourse and in a way that I have come to admire and hope that mm -hmm. other other folk, elected officials, could um, could emulate. Um, it, it, you know, I've been proud to be associated with this board, and I think, um, as I said, there's a way to uh, to disagree agreeably, and that's what I think we're most known for here. And yet, sticking to our 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 guns. I mean, Hamlet from Hamlet: "This above all, to thine own self be true." And I think both of you exemplify that. Um, it fits both of you. So, ladies and gentlemen, we'll have other times today, but let's thank these two folks for their tremendous service. President's going to, um, just as a start for the day, we're going to have some other things during the reception later today, but we wanted to start by 
first of all, I guess before you give them out, we probably have to have the vote on formally adopting. And this is one we don't want to split vote. This is one. <laughs> <laughs> so, and I, I'm confident we will. So the first item is the adoption of resolution honoring Nancy Danhoff. Uh, the chair will entertain a motion. So moved. moved by Chairman sure. McGuire, supported by Richard Zeilig. Um, any further discussion? All in favor, aye. 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 Opposed, same. Thank you. And let's, that makes sense, we'll do mm -hmm. both first. And the next is the, the next is the item, adoption of resolution honoring Marianne McGuire. The chair will entertain a motion. So moved. It's moved by supported. Kathleen, supported by Nancy. Any further discussion? All in favor, aye. 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 Motion passes. Thank you, John. And thank you. Let me let me add my thanks to Marianne and Nancy for your service and your friendship. Um, Marianne, you've got uh, significant service and seniority here as you uh, retire. I just there's there's a resolution which has notes many of your real accomplishments, but I just want to say um, you have um, we knew each other before I was on this board. I think you and Kathy encouraged me to. Uh, join you, uh, which you may have occasionally regretted, but I appreciate that <laughs> encouragement. Um, but Mary, you, you have always been a voice for Detroit, a voice for uh, those young people and people that we were potentially leaving behind. You have always been a strong voice and effective voice for the great diversity that is our state. Uh, the black, brown, Latino, Arab, uh, wonderful diversity that is Michigan. We would not have our foreign language requirement in our high school content if Marianne hadn't insisted upon it as we debated that, which is incredible. And y you, to this moment, uh, have been fighting for what you believe is right with great principle and integrity, and so I want to thank you for that. And on behalf of the board, present thank you with you. this uh, of resolution along with Mike. others will want to chime in briefly as well but Nancy um, likewise you know we had the privilege of working together before you were um, elected and I have to say I was delighted when you were elected and you've been a fantastic partner uh, in all that we've done you have always been um, approaching education with um, integrity and principle independent of any other forces or pressures you were always determined to ferret out what was the right thing to do to improve the quality of education and your service uh, and accomplishments on that as noted in this resolution have been tremendous. Uh, we're going to miss you and I'm going to miss you. But thank you for your, your service on the board and uh, your friendship. I'm going to use, uh, as, as Liz Bauer would say, I'm going to use the bully pulpit for just a second to share with you some things that I've thought about. Things my mother told me I would learn on the State Board of Education, and she was right. <laughs> Policy decisions in education must have their focus on how it provides opportunity for children to be successful. In all likelihood, there is not one person who gets up in the morning and decides to destroy a child's ability to succeed and ruin their life. When working to help all of our children be successful, we must set aside any differences we might have rather than whether they are political, social, or personal. It would be easy to fall into conspiracy theory regarding those who work in public policy and law, but it is better to believe the best of humankind and to challenge them to prove you otherwise. Sometimes we overthink issues when common sense ought to prevail. 
We must always remember to go beyond the moment and consider what happens next. Listening to others and trying to understand their fears, motivations, concerns, and passions will always serve you well. Always try on a theory or a proposed plan of action and walk it through in a day in the life of example before jumping to its support. Remember, practitioners and experts have those titles for good reason. Ask them what they think. No matter how good you feel about making good policy decisions, it is the people who, connect, who enact that policy that will determine their success. In the best ways possible, provide for their capacity to succeed. It is better to look to the future and think of what could be rather than shy from it and only look about what is. It may not be as bad as you think. We serve all of the children and their families in this state. Decisions then need to be made in the best interests of all of them. We would also be wise not to confuse this with every decision will affect every child. It won't, nor should it. Jumping to conclusions regarding other policy or lawmakers' motivations will never get you anywhere. Ask them. Find out what compels them to believe what they do, and then take action. The decision, or excuse me, the discussion is key. Always relish the debate. Always remember what an honor it is to serve the children of this state. And because of that, I'd like to thank you, thank, uh, say thank you to my family, the voters of the state of Michigan, the fine people who work in this department day in and day out, mm -hmm and make us all really look good. The advocates for children around this state, thank you all for that opportunity. Thank you, to serve, thank you for allowing me to serve the children of this state. It has been one of the most humbling experiences of my life. Thanks. And as I, as I said, I hope everyone can join us at the end of the board meeting today because we'd love to have you uh, be part of that reception and, and get to talk to Nancy and Mary Ann directly. Well, we're, we're ready to go to Committee of the Whole. I guess we kind of did earlier and, and talked about one item. And this first item, we have a number of uh, guests here. And in a moment when Sally and Linda and Mike join us at the table on this item, related to Michigan Arts Education survey results. <coughs> they can come down. Marty, bring home the bread. The 2011-12 Michigan Arts Education Survey was conducted to assess the status and condition of arts education in Michigan. It was a collaborative effort between Michigan Youth Arts, the Michigan Department of Education, the Michigan Council of Arts and Cultural Affairs, and ArtServe. I've been a board member of a number of those organizations in the past. The benchmark survey is the first time that Michigan Arts Education Research has included data collected at the school building level. It examines the depth and breadth of student learning in the visual and performing arts, dance, drama, theater, music, media arts, and visual art. In June, I had the privilege of meeting with uh, one of the presenters, and Mike's with us, as well as John Bracey of the Michigan Council for Arts and Cultural Affairs, and I think in the audience, please. There you are. Thanks, John. And Kim Dabbs, who I understand has moved on now to a different position. Uh, and then I also want to, Anna, Anna, welcome back. We miss you and yeah. all the work you've done at the department. We glad you're here today. Uh, Kim Dabbs was the Michigan Youth Arts Executive Director, and she's now Executive Director of the West Michigan Center for Arts and Technology. So with that, I'll turn it over to Sally to more formally introduce Mike, and then uh, I don't know if there are others in the audience that are, are okay. Thanks, Al. Okay. So as Mike uh, shared with you that we had a, I think, a lively discussion when the group came in and went over their survey results, uh, very, very informative and a, just a great conversation about the status of arts and where we need to go and want to be in with arts and education. So without anything further, I'm going to turn it over to Linda and then to Mike. And may I just, I think there are some others uh, in the audience, right, who, who are, if we could just quickly, those folks could introduce, I think Kathy over here, if people could introduce themselves who have been involved in part of that. Um, I'm Kathy Hall, I'm the Director of Arts and Cultural Affairs at the Michigan Youth Arts Center. 
Yes, please. Um, hi, I'm Kathy Dewsbury White. I serve as the current uh, president and CEO of the Michigan Assessment Consortium. And we're very interested today because one of your recommendations that Mike will talk about speaks to assessing art in the state. And we are very pleased to be involved in a program that will um, initiate development of a K-12 arts education and instruction and assessment program in the state. Thank you, Kathy. Is Paul Lickow here? Yes, Paul. Oh, yes. Uh, Paul Lickow, Executive Director of the Michigan School Band and Orchestra Association and a board member of the Michigan Youth Arts Association. Thanks, Paul. And John, I know we just saw Dale. And John, you're welcome to any comment you'd like to before we kick this off. Uh, well, sure. It's wonderful to be back, and it's been great to work with so many uh, uh, really intelligent people because they make me look so good. <laughs> <laughs> and Dale Darling? Yes, Dale. Yes, hi. Um, my name is Dale Darling. I'm the new program director at the Michigan Youth Arts Association. Currently, my second month in the job, and so handling the Michigan Youth Arts Festival is something we were really excited about. Uh, two weeks ago, we just like, launched our uh, Pine Rock Education campaign, which is uh, basically the emotional piece for this Michigan uh, Arts Education Assessment. So, uh, thank you for having us today. Thank you, Dale. Ruth Ann Knapp? Yes. I'm representing the Michigan Music Education Association, and I am also a member of the Michigan Music Arts Association. Thank you. Saravi Pandit? Uh, Mitchell Robinson? Rick Catherman? Yes, good morning. I'm Rick Catherman. I am the current uh, Teacher of the Year for band, um, elected by members of the Michigan School Band and Orchestra Association. I've been working with Mike, very interested to see how the results of this survey are going to impact our students uh, in music education across the state. Thank you. Thank you, Rick. Anyone I missed? Okay, well, thank you. Sally, back to you then. Okay, and I was just turning it over to Linda. We were delighted when uh, we got this information from uh, the Michigan Arts, from the Michigan Arts Education Census. As you know, the department has difficulty collecting some data from schools just because of Headley and all of those requirements. And so these data were very important for us, and we're delighted to have them. We're going to have Mike present them, and then towards the end of this, we'll help you understand some of the things that we are able to do within the department, some of the work we're doing to support this. Well, thank you, and good, and good morning. Uh, thanks for having us up here. Um, you know, I think as Linda mentioned, it's, it, there's some complications and some challenges in terms of gathering arts education data. Um, so back in starting around 2010, 2011, um, Michigan's foundation community stepped up to pay for um, a census, an arts education census, that would really go out to, to every single school in the state um, with the overall goal of getting us this real baseline data of um, you know, what, what types of arts education is in schools, where it's in schools, um, you know, and also show us um, other uh, op you know, opportunities and certainly some challenges and some concerns um, that we can address um, and move forward. Um, really, there's no one organization that can do this. It, it, it really has to be a collaboration. Um, we, we've really, ArtServe, at ArtServe, we've really been blessed to have a partnership with Michigan Youth Arts. Um, and certainly in that partnership of our two nonprofit organizations, um, the, certainly the dedication of, of, of work and knowledge from the Department of Education and certainly the State Arts Council um, to really move this forward, um, not only just the census data, um, but really just moving, moving forward to make sure that arts education is available to every student in Michigan. So as I said, this, this, uh, this survey actually went out um, in, in the fall of 2011. Um, data was actually pulled, in, I want to say, in November of, of that year. Um, it went out to every single public-private charter school in the state um, and was not a mandatory um, uh, a requirement to complete the survey. Um, we saw about uh, 826 schools uh, reply, uh, representing about 30% of, of the students in Michigan. Uh, it's a 20% response rate which uh, is pretty you know, statistically relevant um, and gives us a, gives us a good uh, peek into um, arts education, a baseline survey that we can actually use um, data moving forward. Um, just to get into some of this data, I, I will show you, this was our initial packet of the 96 slides 
um, that, did, that did come out of this data that took us about five hours to go through the first time we read it. So I'm going to spare you all of, the, uh, all of those slides and, go, and just point out a couple. Um, and j before I get into this, this isn't, none of this is all good news, none of it's all bad. Um, certainly, as I, as I mentioned, what this does is kind of give us an idea of where we're at um, and certainly some ideas on where we, need, where we should go um, and some, some suggestions. Um, as you can see here, uh, we wanted to take a look at this first slide to see what, what schools have in terms of arts education from zero all the way up to, four, to all four, dis four arts disciplines. Um, what we saw total, um, you know, in elementary school where 94 percent of all schools have arts education, um, in middle school and high school we have 92 percent um, uh, uh, total. Um, we, looking at it nationally, um, we can't really do um, a, 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 an equal comparison, but in looking at the state or of the U.S. Department of Education's fast response survey uh, that came out, I believe, in April, um, and these overall numbers were were just about just a little under the national average. Um, I, I think by about two or three uh, points um, when you look at these these numbers overall. So, uh, arts education is certainly in Michigan schools. Um, but as you can see, in terms of those lower numbers in red, um, you know, there's some, there's some work to do and some concerns. Um, in elementary school, six, oh, sorry. Just a quick question. Yes. When you say um, uh, one or two disciplines, so a, a school that had <coughs> choir and uh, music theory course would be one discipline, mm -hmm. uh, or, or a school that had band and choir would be one discipline? Sure, it, it, yeah, it'd be dance, music, theater, and visual arts okay. were the four major disciplines that we looked at. Um, so as I, as I was getting to, our, our main concern is really in that bottom, those bottom numbers, um, specifically in the percent of, of high schools that do not offer <coughs> arts education. Um, when you look at those numbers overall, the 8% in uh, high school, 8% in middle, and 6% in elementary school, and add up all, those, all the students in those specific schools, you come up with about 108,000 students in this survey that do not have access to arts education. Um, throughout the work that we're going to be doing uh, moving forward, and certainly I'll mention it probably a couple times today, our main goal is to make sure that that number goes down as close as it can to zero. Um, really ensuring that everything that comes out of this survey is to make sure that every single student has access to arts education moving forward. I, we went over this in our internal meeting a while back, but what, how do you anticipate uh, Kathy Strauss really led the board here in terms of making the arts education credit as part of the MME, uh, MMC. So how is that happening if 8% don't have any? I'm not, I'm not sure. We, we don't know. I, we don't know yet. Um, I think what, what needs to be done is a deeper dive into those, that 8% to take a look at what those specific schools are um, and really get into figuring out what's going on there. Um, next, we wanted to look at the level of arts education in Michigan schools in terms of uh, time provided uh, for visual and, per, uh, visual and performing arts. Um, really, when you look at this over K, K through 6, um, it's, it averages around one and, one and a half hours um, per, uh, per week of total instruction. Um, our, our consultant who did do this survey in, um, in I think, tw uh, 11 or 12 other states as well has told us that when you look at it across, the, across those states, it's, it's about average. Um, ideally, you'd like about two hours per week, um, but in terms of what is going on in other in other states, according to, to this this uh, this data, um, we're, we're right around, we're right around um, average. And the next one is something that, as I said, I, I continue to mention that our our main goal is making sure that every student has access to arts education. But we did find it necessary to to take a look at outside of, of teacher pay, teacher benefits, and everything else surrounding that, what are we spending um, per student at, at, at each level? Um, you'll see in high school, it's $4.39 per student per year. Uh, middle school, two seventy-four, dollars In elementary school, $1.67. Um, when you take into effect that school, days, or school year is around 180 days, um, that's less than a penny a year. Um, not, and I, I want to be clear that this is, I mean, arts education, I, I believe, and I think the superintendent would say that too, is, funding for it is provided in the per pupil allotment. <laughs> so I think that there's some work that we need to do with, um, with administrators in schools um, to make sure that 
through this data, we can pull out some, some models of arts education to say this is how these schools are funding it. Um, so I think in doing that, we might be able to bring this number up, but I think um, just coming off of what we see right now, um, I think it's, you know, one, less than a penny a day, um, you know, really, in my opinion, is, isn't doing it. Um, and this last one, I think, gets, uh, gets, gets back to the um, visual uh, performing and applied arts uh, requirement in high school as well. Um, here, this shows that 88% uh, of schools um, actually meet or exceed the stage one's credit graduation requirement in the arts. Um, I, think, I think that's great news, um, especially the ones, you know, the 15% uh, the that actually exceed the requirement. I think that's fantastic. We need to look at those, at those schools to see how they're doing it and what, what exactly they're doing. Um, the one thing that does concern us is the 12% of high schools that aren't meeting um, the high school graduation requirement in the state. And actually, before I move on to there, um, I did want to just mention that uh, you know we, we, we didn't just provide this data um, and, and want to present it here and say that this is it. Um, we worked with our consultant with um, certainly consortium that was, was mentioned before uh, to develop some recommendations for ourselves uh, moving forward um, in, in certainly ways to make sure that we're able to bring that 108,000 number down to zero um, in the coming years. We know this isn't something that's going to be fixed within one year, um, but we didn't want to simply just release data without saying, here's some of the things that we can work on um, to, uh, to move things forward. Um, as I mentioned, one of our main goals, our, 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 our main goal is making sure that every student has access to arts education. Um, as, as I believe Anna is going to Anna Cardona, Cardona is going to mention in a little while, um, the uh, development a, a, an appropriate uh, student teacher assessment system. Um, the uh, uh, the uh, model arts education instruction and assessment program um, has, is going to be announced, I believe, tomorrow. Uh, a partnership between the Michigan Assessment Consortium, Data Recognition Corporation, uh, and as well as with the Department of Education here. Um, their goal is to uh, really provide a detailed description of a high quality instructional program in the arts based on Michigan's content standards. Um, they're going to include an audit tool for districts to use in assessing the quality of their arts education instructional program, um, and also an assessment, assessment specifications and prototypes that will guide the future development of school assessment in the arts. Um, overall, they're looking at um, developing this um, to uh, this prototype to support educators and the public in implementing high-quality arts education program and to improve instructional offerings in the four arts disciplines of dance, music, theater, and visual arts. And I do apologize for reading that. I just got this yesterday. <laughs> um, there are a couple other recommendations that I'll just blow by quickly. Um, pro uh, professional development, in increased professional development opportunities, not only for teachers, of arts education, but also administrators. Um, I think we need to develop some of those um, some of those models that we can take to administrators and say, here's how he's how here's how they're doing it um, in other schools, um, and and work with them through that avenue too. Um, and certainly identifying just the other way around, schools in need. Um, is there work that we can do through looking tapping into some of these model schools to look to to take some, say, take some things out, identify those schools that have <laughs> no arts education or very little, and go in and see, and see what we can do um, to try to provide some, um, some support to them. Um, and finally, before I turn it back over to Linda, I, just, I, I do want to thank the department. Um, I think the, you know, the commitment that the department has already shown us over the past you know, five, well, five and a half years that I've been here um, is incredible, and specifically in the past, I'd say, year and a half, two years, um, has just uh, really been great, and I appreciate that. Thank you. So what are we up to? What are we doing? You, uh, you've been reminded already that we uh, do have one, rec one credit requirement for visual, performing, and applied arts, and I did remind you that applied arts was a link into CTE and some of the other skills that students can demonstrate around artistic accomplishment. Uh, that that's in place. The grade level and content expectations are in place and were developed by teachers and were finally adopted in June of 2011. And that was thanks to the work of Anna and her committees before she she left us. However, when she left us, she left in one of those retirement periods where we can't replace that position, at least in the short term. And so we've had to work with other folks in order to move the arts concept ahead. And we're grateful to Mary Head and to Megan Schaumbrin, who are helping us with that work. Um, primarily, we're looking at how do we integrate the arts into um, 
everyday curricula as well as having it be a separate standalone class. And so at the uh, Fall School Improvement Conference, our staff worked with the foundations in order to uh, move ahead the, uh, the concept of um, how do we integrate arts content into the curriculum. We know that a student who's exposed to the arts does well in other classes and it helps them to better formulate answers to questions they may have about the content. So we've been doing that. I've already been through the career and college ready uh, uh, pieces today in an earlier presentation, so I won't go through that at this point in time. But I would say to you that we're working very hard to move this ahead, and we are so grateful for the foundations and the help that they're giving us, because without them, we wouldn't have this information right now, and we look forward to being able to work with them in order to move this conversation forward. Thank you. Mike? I don't want to miss the chance to first of all thank Nancy for mentioning capacity in the department and then maybe to say out loud that um, we're still trying to get uh, budget consideration for a policy that um, is probably necessary at the time but by happenstance if you happen to have people retire and couldn't replace them that that was uh, particularly <coughs> devastating to this department if you look at the statistics. And I also want to give a shout out to MAISA. I, I got a copy of their 50th anniversary. They've been in place 50 years now as ISDs. And they showed each of the decades the number of folks at the department, starting with the 3,500, that whatever that first decade was, down to our 300 or so now. And most of those, as you know, are, are federally funded employees that are doing federal work, <coughs> not state work. So we're hoping to recoup some of that. And I, I, I want to just emphasize the capacity issue that Nancy's talking about has had an impact. I mean, you can't pretend that not being able to replace Anna hasn't uh, made this more difficult, even though I appreciate the shout out, Mike. So, questions from, from board members? Eileen. Eileen. Well, having moderated the 2008 NAVE uh, Visual and Performing Arts release and having had a lot of questions uh, at that point on the data that they showed, um, uh, which in part resulted from the rapid response, uh, resulted in, in uh, the April rapid response survey. I have to say that I'm stunned that I wasn't involved in this effort on the um, on the state's level. I would have uh, been uh, interested in doing something with you and talking with you. Uh, the survey looks very good. Um, at the time that we did the 2008 NAEP release, um, there were inconsistent an answers on knowledge versus frequency of, uh, or, I'm sorry, on the number of kids who were taking the courses. And one of the things that we were trying to find out is uh, are a few of the kids taking all of the courses in middle and high school, actually in, in the NAEP survey, which only went through eighth grade, uh, there was the, the high school wasn't even dealt with as, a, as an age group. But one of the concerns that I've had um, is that uh, we may not be doing as good a job in high school uh, with um, uh, provision of, of arts education if uh, the narrowing of the kid, number of kids in middle school taking the courses uh, seems to dictate that fewer kids need them in high school. In other words, it's a demand. And I can't, um, obviously, if you feel like you have no money to provide arts courses, you're going to go that route anyway. But it is an interesting question. I don't know if the survey does uh, uh, anything with that. There is a, a note on uh, one of the slides on page three that um, one of the questions you asked is the number of students enrolled in arts courses, but it's just not addressed on the slide. So if you have an answer to that, it'd be interesting. And the, I wanted to know also whether the, you got a representative sampling of low SES schools. Uh, or uh, obviously, if, there, if people feel there's less money to work with specials, um, then the arts are one of the first places to get hit, according to conventional wisdom. The NAEP survey didn't show that. Um, it showed sort of a broad distribution of schools that were and weren't doing arts education. But I'm wondering, given we expected that um, lower uh, SES schools would be the hardest hit for providing arts courses, and it didn't show that in 2008. And I'm wondering whether uh, this survey does. Sure, I, I, I think I can answer a little. I mean, it's you know, I think we're you know our capacity is is low as well. Um, we're, we're you know we just lost Kim as, as Superintendent Flanagan said. Um, we are actually working with our consultant and our data team to dive deeper um, into this data. Um, when we first pulled this pulled this data, we we were told that it is uh, geographic ge geographically spread out throughout the state in terms of the data. Um, but next, you know, uh, round two of kind of our look into this data is to be able to go online 
and look at it by, um, by specific school and I think by county as well. And once, we're our, once we do have that capability, uh, which will be an online system, uh, we'll be able to look into that. Um, right now, I think the, the, the data that we have is, is just very top line. Um, once, once we are able to look into that, I think that um, you know, we'll make sure to work with, um, with Mary and, and Linda in the department to, to get that information out. The reason I ask is because there's two reasons I hear for not doing the arts. One is that there's not enough demand, which if there's a narrowing of the number of kids involved in middle school would certainly allow people to go in that direction. The other one is the lack of money. And if you know geographically where people are, if you can see where the narrowing is, what the impact is on not having these in art programs in elementary school, it could be that um, outsiders would be willing to try to help address this in some way. Um, obviously, you are with advocacy, but that's not, uh, we don't know whether that's effective for uh, different kinds of schools. And isolating which type are the most hit by this would be great. Thank you. I'm glad, so glad that you did the survey. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Eileen. And we're, and we're still open to um, any assistance you'd like to give in that regard. Well, I, what, I, you know, we seem to have gone into science for the time being, so, but I hear you, I hear you. <laughs> okay. Kathleen, I think, with your interest uh, and, well, and constant you. support. This around this way. I'm glad to know that this has been done and it's been a long time coming. Um, it's interesting to me to see that 12%, the 12 percent of the, of the schools do not even do the one credit? How did they get away with that, Mike? Well, that's, where that, that, that's where my question was. The only thing I can think of is, is what Linda said about it, it can show up in the CTE area. I don't know how well that measurement would cover some of the applied arts yeah. in CTE that Mike shared with us. But I think it's worth, it's worth trying to understand more. Because it was, that was one of the things we really pushed to get at least some art in the high right. school curriculum. So maybe there's a way with Patty we can see if that 12% is covered somehow with applied arts. But uh, yeah, on the surface it's troublesome, and it, it was back to when we had our in-house meeting. But, um, it's good to see Anna here. Uh, I was on the board for, I think it was six years I kept pushing for an arts person on the staff. I think it took six years, and we had you for how long? And now we're, we don't have anybody again. And it's uh, it's unfortunate because I think the arts do help teach, it, it have people express their creativity in different ways and things that they can do that they didn't think they could do. And it makes them think, it really makes them think. It's more than just drawing, it's thinking that I think is the important part of this. But I just hope that we'll be able to have enough budget to be able to hire, you know, hire a nurse person on the staff again. I think it's really important. And I'm very glad that our service coordinated this, and I assume they did. And uh, we had to keep plugging away. We can't let this drop. And with all the emphasis on career <coughs> and college ready, this sort of gets pushed aside by a lot of people. And I think they've missed, they missed the boat. They just don't realize how valuable arts education is and should be and can be. Thank you. Thank you, Kat. Richard and John. I'm very concerned with this area and I'm, I'm very uh, pleased to see some attention given to it. Uh, my daughter is a proud graduate of Detroit School for Fine and Performing Arts. Um, and. Uh, uh, so I, I have a number of concerns in this area. One is uh, the survey seems to focus on the arts as ends. I know a lot of schools uh, use, make use of the arts as means. For example, my, my daughter DSA, she took a dance class to meet the phys ed requirement. Now whether that showed up in the survey as a, you know, as a PE class uh, or an art class, I'm I'm not entirely sure, but I, I do know that a number of these uh, schools do that. I know that uh, Armada uh, District that was near the bottom of MEEP scores uh, 10 years ago um, uh, in, uh, rose near the top uh, in part by implementing arts courses and, and 
things that enrich the curriculum rather than impoverish the curriculum. That is the, the unintent, one of the unintended consequences of, of focusing on the bones of uh, education is that we encourage people to neglect the muscles and then the whole body dies anyway. You know. uh, so I'm, I'm really interested in, uh, and finally the third aspect of it is that many children grow up without any interest at home, as you say, the lack of demand, well, that's, you know, it, it may be counterintuitive, but maybe the lack of demand is why we should be, uh, be a little, if, if you'll pardon my use of the word evangelical about, uh, <laughs> about spreading arts and exposing kids to, to uh, arts. I, I can think of nothing more enriching and helpful in terms of cultural enrichment uh, than arts education. So I, I I'm very concerned with this on a lot of fronts and look with great interest at what kinds of suggestions or things we develop. We're very Catholic, small c, okay. the way that we look at the okay. world. Yeah. John. I just want to add to that and thank you for your work in, in trying to elevate the importance of arts education. It is, we've got to understand it is one, not only one of the bones, you know, in, in everything I do, to Kathy's point, uh, we're trying to understand what matters most to the economy, and not only does art provide beauty and enrich our lives, there's a, there's a growing understanding that the kind of creative and innovative thinking that arts education nurtures is perhaps the most important uh, asset to uh, create new ideas, new products. Um, you know, when Steve Jobs died, there was eulogizing of his contribution, and he said it himself you know, he, before he died. He combined incredible technical skill and computer science, he obviously knew algebra too, but with a what he called an aesthetic, a liberal arts, and artistic sensibility, which gave people products that they didn't know they needed, uh, and that created massive amounts of wealth, jobs. You know, we have examples in Michigan of the the artists from the College of Creative Studies who designed the Chrysler 300 or the Ford Fusion that makes it uh, sell more <coughs> and employ more people uh, as uh, direct contributions. And you know, I'm afraid with all due respect to you know, Eileen, we've got to um, make arts education uh, uh, not only funded but um, co-equal and integrated with the rest of our education. Uh, it, it is pushed aside in favor of the math rigor and things that we're insisting upon. Uh, and we can't rely on philanthropy and other money to build it in. We have to be willing as a state to invest in arts education and invest in education period in ways that uh, a matter most to our economy, and this is one of them. I would say, by the way, that our own kids, uh, when they were in school, we originally had to force them to take music, and, uh, and it turned out to be something they loved. But I'm a firm believer, and the research is pretty supportive of this, of its connection with their ability then to have done math better than they may have without that. Um, so it's even it even connects in the way you infer, John, directly to things like math in addition to the aesthetic. Dan. Let me add my thanks uh, to you on getting this uh, survey done. Um, I am, so I'm actually, uh, I have to admit, pleasantly surprised by the number of schools that uh, are not in the red on that first uh, <laughs> bar chart, frankly. Um, uh, and I'm curious, Art is one of those places, it seems to me, where we have um, a uh, kind of growing, well, a stronger than usual partnership between uh, in-school educators and out-of-school uh, educators. Uh, I'm wondering, I don't know if that's true or not, but that's my personal sense about it. Um, I'm wondering if um, the survey here was really just about uh, in-school art programs, is that correct? So it yes. was, did not include kind of if you were a school that was partnered with a Sphinx, say, to offer your mu music program, that was not included in the survey, is that right? We did, we actually did, we do have questions of um, what was taken outside outside of the school. Okay. Um, and I can provide that data. It's in, it's in this, this 96 Is it in the full page? So uh, on the it's website, in, is it in the full it's report? It's in the full report, report yes. Okay. Yes, and then uh, does the full report also include information on the... Um, 
geographic dispersal and the socioeconomic status kind of uh, no. distribution of schools that respond to the survey? <coughs> Not yet. That's okay. that's kind of our next round of, of, of research that we need to do. Um, we're actually we're just waiting on our um, on our um, researcher to right. build that website and that capacity for us so we can dive into it ourselves. Well, I would love it if you would share that information with us when you guys have it. Absolutely. Great. Thanks. Thanks, Dan. You know, I, we haven't, as Kathy said, we're still working on trying to get past mm -hmm. this happenstance that because good people were eligible to retire and took the retirement incentive that that by definition that we couldn't replace the position. It just wasn't the way to think about policy. Having said that, I don't want to not acknowledge as Linda did, but Mary and Megan, would you stand up a moment because we do have folks that are working on this in an integrated <coughs> way. I appreciate your efforts there and I don't want to mm -hmm. minimize those, so thank you. Okay. Well, great. Mike, thanks so much. Thank Everyone much. took the time today. You can see how important this is to the, to the board and the department, and we, we very much appreciate your efforts. Thank you. Okay. I, uh, the next item is the discussion on the school aid rewrite. Some, some have known it as either the Oxford or the McClellan plan and other legislative recommendations. And just wanted to mention to the audience that this is a board's effort, largely led by John, uh, uh, who's done, I thought, a, a great job in trying to coordinate some of this with uh, the entire board, in, in being able to give input by the 14th to those folks before they actually present a report to the governor. And we think that's really a critical time that we might be able to impact that before the governor actually receives the report. And then at that point, he's going to presumably take that during his, if nothing else, during his budget proposal is where this ultimately is going to come out. And um, John, again, thanks for so much for your leadership on this. And I'll turn it right over to you. I'd like to thank uh, my colleagues in the legislative committee that met and contributed to uh, these ideas and recommendations. Um, I want to provide a little context, though. You notice Marianne left uh, uh, fearing that I would talk for a while now, but actually she went to go to the demonstration, um, and we did uh, integrate comments from her. I just want to put this in context a bit. I mean, we, we need to, I think, make a, uh, a robust commentary on the uh, Oxford Foundation's um, finance uh, proposals, but also um, make our own, and really what we're doing here is, is a, a, a fast-track version of the study that we wanted to do that got subsumed by the, the governor's project of uh, make our recommendations for how we can accomplish and think we can accomplish some of the stated goals for uh, the work that's underway uh, uh, and perhaps do it more effectively and better uh, then and, and help improve and even transform perhaps the kind of ideas that are coming from the, the Oxford Foundation. Uh, we do want to support um, individualized learning and growth. We do want to uh, figure out how to take advantage of new modalities like online and blended learning if they help students learn uh, our content better and work for them. We do want to create and support more choices for parents and families, again, if they work better to achieve learning and quality education. And we do want to support more performance incentives and funding that rewards growth and learning, uh, all to the goal of meeting these college and career standards that we started the morning with. And so I, I do think it's important that we uh, reflect on, as we're doing here in this draft document, um, with the kind of issues and concerns, particularly about the school finance proposals, but also provide our own uh, robust uh, set of recommendations on how to accomplish some of the goals that are the stated goals uh, of the NEs, but the, uh, the uh, goals that I just articulated. And I also think it's really important, though, that we acknowledge that this, this school finance proposal is connected and interconnected with the other proposals that are also authored by the Oxford Foundation, proposals for new unlimited online learning, new school creation, specialty schools, the creation of a marketplace to shop for education a la carte, uh, and we need to uh, help these rather dramatic ideas uh, for big change in how we organize and fund schools take a shape and, and take a shape that ultimately uh, achieves the goals that we have to make them achieve. How do they increase quality learning and better outcomes for students that, that may take new learning opportunities or new choices? And how do they uh, not diminish 
the quality of learning and outcomes for other students in our existing public schools. So, you know, there is a lot of concern. I, I sent around um, articles uh, from good analysis of other states as they are trying to advance um, online learning and a la carte education. Uh, we're certainly needing to reflect thoughtfully on uh, how to do this effectively and this one article, uh, online schools face backlash, which may be overstated, I mean exploding popularity. You know, it does suggest in Maine, New Jersey, North Carolina, uh, officials are, are slowing down, refusing to allow new cyber schools, citing concerns about poor academic performance, high rates of student turnover. In Pennsylvania, the Auditor General has issued a report calling for revamping a funding formula that overpays online schools. In Florida, state education officials are investigating a virtual school after uh, concerns of uncertified teachers. These are just not meant to, to um, color the discussion, but to say there are real issues here that need to be um, thoughtfully considered as we look at the whole complex of expanded choice, new modalities, and I think what, what I hope we can do and what I hope this draft document um, helps us begin to do is to say what, how do we uh, uh, move some of the goals of individualized performance, enhance quality choices, um, support for performance funding, uh, potential unbundling or a la carte uh, facilitation that allows students to shop. How do we do that in ways, again, that increase learning and quality learning and uh, increase learning and quality learning for all our schools and don't uh, wittingly or unwittingly um, take resources or diminish learning opportunities for other folks. So um, this document, uh, I think our goal today, I hope, would be to be willing to um, support a version of this that we could share publicly as our commentary and our recommendations, uh, knowing that we're going to have, we as a, as a state are going to have a fulsome discussion about how we do any and all of this and how we improve on the ideas and work together and improve on the ideas. As always, this board, uh, is interested in finding the right education improvement common ground. You know, when I talked about Nancy and her contributions, we as a bipartisan group have found ways to work together and articulate, uh, I was going to say recipes, but I've been uh, <laughs> curbed from my um, culinary analogies like of it. late. Like so it. we find the right uh, uh, policies and strategies that improve education. Um, you know, I could. Um, quickly tick off the core recommendations here, or we could, um, if people have a copy, we could just open it up and share um, comments from other board members on uh, what you like and or is there anything you don't like. And I think there may be some things in, in our recommendations here about how to ensure quality, how to uh, do performance funding effectively, how to potentially unbundle parts of learning uh, for good impact that not everybody's going to agree to here. Uh, but we need to figure out what we can, uh, we need to make a strong statement of what we need to, um, uh, our concerns as well as our recommendations. John, it would probably be helpful for the five people watching out there if you kind of tick <laughs> through right. the, the items on right. the document. Maybe more. So, um, very quickly. Um, <laughs> the, the first uh, issue, which I think is probably one of the most significant issues, is uh, we, we have been living with a system of and trying to support a system of neighborhood schools that do have a geographic uh, monopoly on their students. And we've tried to support those systems. We've even tried to fix them when they're failing. Um, as we introduce any sort of market elements of expanded choice or new vendors, one of the appropriate needed ingredients is we have got to, and it is appropriate to say, we don't need more new schools or new education offerings if they don't provide quality education that increases learning and achievement. Uh, we don't need any more bad n new schools that we're going to have to fix or shut down later. So I think the, the recommendations in the quality control uh, are as we open up any new, um, as we authorize any new schools or online learning, uh, we should be one, having them uh, held accountable by the same metrics that we hold our existing schools accountable uh, and report on same. Every district has to report in our top to bottom list 
wh which schools of theirs are performing every authorizer, because those are the public bodies accountable, needs to report uh, how their schools are performing on our, uh, on our uh, top to bottom rankings and on our growth and, and um, accountability system. But I do believe we should be recommending rectifying the, the problem that uh, was created last year. And if any new specialty schools or new schools or new online schools are created, uh, A, we should prevent uh, operators from being authorized who have a bad track record of educating kids, not open more schools. And B, there are going to be good new learning um, providers, new uh, schools that have a good promise of educating schools better. They should at least have a credible plan and expectation uh, and, and be credible in their ability to perhaps deliver quality education. And there are ways to frame that that I think can be framed appropriately. So that's number one. Um, the second section on expanding quality choices fully uh, touches on many of mostly concerns with the proposal from the finance, um, the, the school finance proposal um, about uh, perhaps expanding choices that aren't going to be fair, equitable, or work for many of our students. Uh, one issue being uh, if you uh, allow more choices but uh, many parents and families don't have transportation or ability to actually execute a choice, can't get to the school district next over to take the IB program or the high-end math, uh, that's not potentially fair or equitable. You might be leaving students. Rural students might beyond online learning have just less choices under this, uh, this uh, recipe or formula. Um, special needs populations are not attended to whatsoever and English language learners and that's a significant issue for us all as a state to wrestle with. Uh, where do they fit in this potential expanded marketplace for education? How do they get a great education? <coughs> and it is somewhat potentially discriminatory and somewhat um, hypocritical to say we're, we're, not, we're, we're ending the neighborhood school's monopoly on your student. You have to let students go to shop. Oh, but if you want to keep students out of your schools, you can discriminate against them and not let them in, which is, um, is, is certainly contradictory. If you're ending the neighborhood school as the framework, you need to, and you're providing more choices, you have to allow any and all choices to be chosen. Uh, the students, potentially, if this is your model, the students in a Detroit or Pontiac or Flint or Grand Rapids should have access to Bloomfield Hills or Forest Hills if that's the best choice for them. Uh, under this model, again, so there's some inconsistencies in the approach uh, that about how you facilitate equal choice and equitable choice. So that's number two. The number three, I think, where we certainly have probably have the strongest um, uh, consensus, as I sense it here and elsewhere, is when any and all schools or learning modalities need to be measured by the same yardstick, uh, the same uh, academic content, career-ready content standards, the same accountability system, we can't go back to having 50 or 500 uh, schools, vendors of education, measure their kids' learning any way they want. Uh, we need to know if kids are learning and we need to be able to compare them for parents and for policymakers. Uh, any performance funding that we attach to that should be performance on meeting our college and career-ready standards and growth. That's part of the discussion we had at the beginning of the meeting. And we should potentially be making financial rewards for performance uh, that do uh, reward performance, not be a penalty, you lose students, you lose money, uh, let's reward performance uh, on, our, on our same career and college ready standards. And finally, there's, there's, I'm concerned and I think others are concerned, this whole proposal, the school finance proposal as it currently is proposed, um, continues <laughs> the negative, the disincentive model versus providing a positive incentive model. Every school and district would be eager not to facilitate a good choice out of district or a good online program because they lose the money. That's already what happens in our dual enrollment, in our career technical world. Uh, districts do not want to lose the money, then, so they don't facilitate, they don't encourage. We need a model that encourages a school district or a school to help the student choose a good piece of education if it can be done at a community college or if it's done at the district next door or if it's done online that helps them meet their learning goals. So we're, we're continuing a punishment disincentive structure when we need to have a incentive structure that reinforces the behavior that we want to see, um, which is a significant uh, concern. 
Um, the next section talks about unbundling funding, this idea of um, students shopping with pieces of their foundation grant. Um, I think our recommendations, and I, I hope would be, uh, we can do some of that, more of that. Um, A, potentially let's do it starting at the secondary school level, where do we really want to unbundle funding for K-6 elementary students when we expect them all to learn the same thing and shop around for their education? Is that both realistic and or desirable? High school, it makes a lot of sense to have a high school student take the course they can't get at their high school somewhere else or get into the community college and have incentives that reward that or take the online program that's best for them. Um, but if we're going to unbundle funding too, um, we need to recognize that uh, we need to have differential unbundling <coughs> of funding. Um, it, uh, you get more learning outcomes in a full service in-person school where you have teachers as mentors and guides, where you have the other benefits of working in teamwork. We had a presentation this morning that talked about college and career standards, including teamwork and ability to work together. You do not get that skill building in an online-only education, potentially. Uh, you also don't get arts and band and school newspaper and a counselor to guide you in your college and career ready. Many of our institutions, like a career technical program or a middle or early college, they deliver even more learning outcomes, which is what we care about. They earn certificates. Uh, they earn credentials at the post-secondary level in those programs. So you need to, we need to pay more for schools that deliver more and that cost more as well. Uh, and if you pay a foundation grant co-equal for any form of learning, uh, you're creating incentives for all the new operators to provide the least cost learning. And, and the big issue too, how do you sustain a uh, full service school with all the benefits in learning and socialization and, and the arts that uh, that, that provides uh, if you don't differentially fund uh, the elements that, that matter. And so that's, I think, an important feature. Um, and if we, again, if we if we somehow encourage unbundling at the secondary school level, let's help our ISDs and our um, local communities develop all these new school variants, specialty schools, new school institutions, but manage it and incent them to, um, to manage that system so that it will encourage the students to, uh, to get what they need in a local regional context. Uh, and finally, on the, there are a number of recommendations about um, the other elements, uh, many of them good, that are in these proposals. Uh, we need to uh, invest in early childhood education and make that priority, which I think is part of the, the proposals from everyone at the moment. Longer school year and in school incentives uh, for longer school days are good ideas. And I know some of my colleagues uh, and Mike might have some further suggestions on how to do that right. Uh, but that's a great idea. We need to incent longer school year and longer school days. Um, the, the early graduation scholarship, as proposed, uh, only rewards high achievers who accelerate early. Uh, it does not support the benefits of early college credit taking in all its forms, uh, which have been rigorously researched and documented. At-risk kids and those who are potential dropouts are perhaps the ones most um, supported by early college credit taking, dual enrollment, getting into a middle college, which gets them in a new place, challenges them, uh, provides a different context for learning that is proven to help them graduate at higher levels and go into post-secondary education at higher levels. So again, if what we care about and what's stated to be cared about is um, college and career preparation and getting to college and career destinations, we need to create an incentive structure that supports uh, early college credit taking in all its forms. Uh, for all students, not just the high achiever. Great to pay for more for college scholarships. We should be paying for early college and post-secondary participation. If you really want to have any pace learning and blur the lines, we should be uh, rewarding all of that. Uh, Mike and his team have done a wonderful job, as I hope we'll talk about, on um, decoding other many important technical issues around how accountability systems and things would work, which I know are part of what I think we want to offer in terms of our recommendations. But uh, again, uh, poor Mar Marianne, be glad she just missed this. Mm -hmm. uh, but thank you um, for the work together to put these ideas forward. And again, I hope we can um, promote a, uh, a fulsome both commentary and set of recommendations uh, as are reflected, I believe, in this document.
by the way. We weren't critiquing the culinary. My, the folks I work with have been using the word recipe more often, so it's just bleeding <laughs> over. Uh, board members' comments and thoughts to John's points. Mm. Kath, you look oh, like you're. And, and oh, Kath and Eileen. Uh, I thank John for working on this and preparing this, and, uh, giving people ideas and so on. But um, I have a problem with the underlying premise of, of this whole proposal. That's a, and that is a lot of what's contained in House Bill 5923 to create, to have other people authorize more school businesses. I don't like that idea. I don't like the idea of the, creating all these new schools. I think we have authorized, we've taken the cap off the charter schools so we can create as, you know, many, many, many more charter schools and they're doing it. And they can create many more cyber schools and I'm presuming they're doing it. And I think we've got enough there are enough choices out there. I don't think we need any more authorizers. That's so I disagree with the basic premise. And I just so I don't know how I how I react to the whole thing by saying no. I mean that's that's the only thing I, I think I can do is to say I, I oppose this proposal. Mm -hmm. At the same time I'd like to do a lot of what John is is saying to make it better because probably something like it will pass. Uh, I don't know how, how quite to do that, so we'll have to figure that out. So, from, you know, we can go on, we can go through this paper paragraph by paragraph, I guess. But it, just for starters, I would like to use the uh, approach that we used in our previous papers that we did, the reactions. Start off the, the beginning by say, citing the constitutional role of the, of the state board and what our role is, rather than that we're eager to lead and advise, which we are, but we want to I guess, you know, premise that with the uh, that which is constitutional for this for starters. I, I don't want to like, somebody else say something or I can talk some more maybe later. But I'm very upset with this whole proposal and. Uh, I'm pleasure to vote no on it. Thank you. I think it was Eileen, then Richard, then Cassandra. And I'm glad that Kathleen said what she did just now because one of the things that I would say is, is this going to be taken up in lame duck? Because if it's not, I think we would need a little more time as a board to uh, get past uh, Kathleen's opposition for it and my support for it. I mean, we just need to figure out what parts are good and what parts need correcting. But one of the things I wanted to, and John, I didn't, John, I, I know your list of concerns that, um, that have been voiced, and I wanted to just say to all of those that it flies in the face that the, the, um, the extensive opportunities that are in the bill fly in the face of a lot, but not all, of the conditions that we're finding in public schools right now. There certainly are problems with the bill, making sure that people who come in are, uh, if they have a track record, that we know what that track record is. That's totally logical. But I look at some of the people who are the most opposed to this bill and see the innovations that they're doing in the district and marvel at the fact, at the disconnect right now, the emotional disconnect between the kind of creativity that we're seeing in the school system and the fact that they don't want more of it. I don't understand that because I see a lot of them moving gently and not necessarily with full vigor, but exploring the things that are going to help kids learn better. And I also hear tremendous entrenched interest saying we will not change. So this bill to me is a door opening for more consistency in things that are requiring seat time waivers right now and issues that um, if we stop them are not going to help children. I would ask all the way through in this bill, how will this help children learn? Because I understand that it shakes up the uh, atmosphere, the, uh, the operating systems, the focus of, uh, of, of public schools that they exist today. And one thing I did want to point out, John, in, in the voice response to this, it's an emotional response. It has to be because it's a, it's a big uh, undertaking to try and uh, make these kinds of changes for children. 
But um, I had an interesting, when we did the Detroit side of the Michigan, sorry, the Michigan Science Center uh, Strategic um, Planning Center, <coughs> we pulled in uh, the man who revitalized and ran the New York Hall of Science for 22 years, uh, Alan Friedman, who uh, would be proud to have me say that he's a staunch Democrat and somebody who um, is always trying to find solutions for children that work. He was in Long Beach about, oh, two months ago. And he found that Long Beach was educating its children spectacularly in STEM and the arts on about $6,000 a year. And his first response to the situation was, how can you possibly be doing this? And the answer was that the entire faculty was focused on the mission of educating children. And then he set about to find out who populated the most successful schools who are sending children to Ivy League colleges and to research institutions. And he found that in the absence of busing, parents were carpooling, that parents who had enough moxie to figure out which schools they wanted their kids to go to were coming together to form carpools. In an era, and that was determining who got into the schools because they were able to apply. So in an era where we're cutting back on school busing, even in academic <coughs> districts, and trying to figure out how to juggle all of this, despite the fact that we are looking at huge change here and saying you know, there may not be access, there probably will be because creative parents with a mission to educate their children and good educators who are, who are committed to the same thing are going to find out how to do it. And the, the question is what doors should be open to make that, to allow that to happen and what doors should remain firmly closed. And I look forward to working on this. However, if we don't need to do it at this public meeting where um, it, it's a little difficult to get all the nuances on paper in a timely basis, but it might be smart to try and take it back to committee. Thanks. Thank you, Richard and Cassandra and Dan. <coughs> um, I am, uh, I know Kathleen said she was troubled by this. I'm, I'm more intrigued by it. Um, I do share some of the, the concerns, I think. Uh, I think the devil is in the details. And I think there are some very legitimate concerns um, that have been raised in the past, and some of which are, are reflected in this position paper. However, it does strike me that uh, many of the objections in, in, the, uh, in the draft here is really pitting, making, <coughs> making uh, the perfect the enemy of the good. We can't guarantee perfect equity for every student and that's used as an argument for not advancing equity for students, not increasing choice. Uh, we can't guarantee the quality of uh, these new educational enterprises. It overlooks the fact that we haven't been able to guarantee the quality of all of our public school districts. Um, so I, I think that there is some risk, and the risk is um, uh, in, in the position paper, I think the risk is taken a little out of perspective in, in that sense. Um, I, I do share some concerns, particularly with online cyber schools. It seems to me that traditionally we expect teachers to supervise and instruct. Cyber schools do a great job of instructing the same way that books in the library used to. Uh, but you, we, don't, we don't fund libraries on a per pupil basis. Uh, the way we do schools, and I, I, I think we need to s ask cyber schools how they fulfill uh, the supervisory uh, aspect. Otherwise, I'm also I'm, I'm a little unsure as to the switch from performance, uh, from seat time to performance. Seat time is measurable. Uh, you know, I give an hour of instruction to each of my students, and one makes twice as much progress as the other. Well, it'd be easy for me to take credit for what happens naturally. Mm -hmm. And a lot of us in education have done that traditionally. And that's the problem with measuring performance. Then you incentivize everyone to work with the kids who can perform and neglect the ones that can't perform. So I, I'm, there, are, there are aspects that I think need to be thought through. Our thoughtful uh, critique uh, is definitely needed. Um, but I think, uh, I, I think that we do need to acknowledge that quality is not one-dimensional, that a quality school for dance and performing arts uh, is, is different from a quality school for uh, science and uh, mathematics. And I suspect that um, 
the requirements of the one uh, that the same requirement makes the school a quality math school may uh, keep it from being quality uh, dance school and vice versa. So I, I and that's where opening uh, school choice allows for a diversity of educational delivery systems um, to meet the variety of student needs. And as important in my mind is a variety of curricular offerings because Michigan and our country will need the variety of specialties that a diverse system based on choice can provide. And a final observation is in terms of choice and whether it, uh, its effect on public schools. Uh, we need to point out that school choice in Detroit has benefited neighboring public school districts. There are more Detroit resident students in Royal Oak and neighboring districts directly benefiting other urban districts affected by demographic change and mainly the shrinking, the loss of students in their communities, um, than have actually gone to charter schools. So public school districts have been the beneficiaries of school choice. And it's the programs that have a quality, it's the quality programs that benefit from choice. Um, and the way this works in uh, two districts uh, near where I live, uh, Southgate's got a stronger uh, math program, Taylor's got a stronger culinary program, it makes sense for kids in Southgate who want to study culinary arts to go to Taylor. That program will continue to grow and it makes sense for kids who want to specialize in what Southgate's strong in of go there and that will continue to grow. Uh, that instead of two neighboring districts with mediocre bands, you may have one district with no band, another one with a, a much better band. I think that ends up serving students um, uh, better in the long run. Thank you. Cassandra. Um, thank you. First of all, I just want to commend John um, because I think you did a really good job of, of pulling together all of the comments that we made at the um, legislative committee meetings over the last uh, couple months and putting it together into a very well-written document. And so I really appreciate that. Um, to the question of why do this now, uh, we discussed at the legislative, I just want to give a little bit of background on why this came about. We discussed at the legislative committee meeting the fact that there's really three bites at the apple, if you will, uh, to steal a phrase from Mike. Um, one is, the, the deadline, the looming deadline um, for uh, the Oxford group to send this to the governor's office. The second one is the governor coming out with his own legislation and the third is what comes out of the legislature. So this really is just um, focused solely on what has been prepared uh, from the Oxford group so that we can, as a state board of education, um, basically put our uh, opinions on record in that first stage of this development of this bill. It certainly does not mean that we uh, are supportive of what comes out and it, it also uh, means that we recognize that what may come out of the actual governor's and legislator's office may look nothing like <coughs> what uh, is being transferred over to them um, within the next few weeks. So with that being said, um, I agree with, with Kathleen and your concerns that um, you know, if this were the actual piece of legislation, I would say, you know, my opinion too would be, let's just uh, say we have major concerns and, and go with that. Um, but I do think it's important that we clarify that this really is our uh, first attempt at providing input into the very first stage of what could potentially be a legislative rewrite of the School Aid Act. Um, I think we should make it very clear in here that because we're offering um, input and suggestions does not mean that we are offering buy-in on what has been proposed. Um, so with that being said, um, the, the one thing that I would recommend as far as changes to this document, if we do in fact decide to, to move forward with this. I'm sorry. So with that being said, if we decide to move forward um, with this, I do have a recommendation, uh, and that is on page five, to eliminate the second bullet point, which talks about um, specialty schools and 
um, unlimited new forms of schools and special designation schools. This, we have made it a point up until now to say that the three pieces of legislation should be decoupled. So I think that um, I, I would prefer not to acknowledge uh, House Bill 5923 <laughs> in this. Um, and that, that, is, uh, that is my recommendation. Thank you, Cassandra. Mm -hmm. Dan. And I do think you outlined that well in terms of suggestions at this point, not necessarily meaning support of what may come out down the road, and we'll have those other shots. Right. Uh, and so on page five, if I could put you back onto that, uh, at the beginning of the page, um, it's listed that it's, uh, the third the third line says unbundle learning for K five or K six. In my experience, it's mostly K five uh, for elementary schools and six through eight through middle school. I don't know if that's a typo, but we certainly have this touched on, but not thoroughly discussed the concept that there are ISDs, for example, that already have uh, robotics programs uh, for middle schoolers that are centralized. And things like that may be happening in sixth grade, but not happening as best. Thank you. Dan. Uh, so I want to add as well uh, my commendation to John Kudos um, on um, pulling together this document um, uh, and for your leadership just in this work generally. I think um, uh, Mike's acknowledgement of our board's ability to work um, uh, across party lines, I think, is um, uh, largely due to your efforts. Uh, at least during my tenure here, um, to to come up with things that that allow for that to happen. So I appreciate your leadership in that regard. Um, uh, so I want to echo Kathy's comment, uh, and I do have language tied to all of this that I can um, provide. Uh, that we uh, begin the document by um, referring back to our constitutional obligation to provide leadership and general supervision over all public education. Um, I do also think that we should explicitly uh, in the opening paragraph or two um, uh, say that this document, um, that the board is taking no position on the proposal in opposition or in support, but rather this document is intended to provide advice, guidance, suggestions, critique, recommendations, whatever our appropriate language is on the proposal. Um, I think there'll be ample time for us to, you know, have yay nay votes uh, on whatever uh, happens to get introduced in the legislature or is introduced in the legislature. Um, this, it's frankly premature at this point in time to do that. I think our our obligation, um, given kind of the state of affairs, is to make sure that some recommendations um, are received from this body um, to those that are working on this. Uh, on this. Um, Two other things, just big picture things. I mean, I, I really agree with um, the overwhelming majority of what's in here uh, and really pleased to see that this pulls from a lot of the principles that we articulated uh, as a group um, and provided to the working group at Oxford um, some time ago around quality control and apples to apples <coughs> comparisons and, and <coughs> equitable uh, expansion of choice and the like. Um, just two quick things I think that are um, worth saying that are supportive of uh, the document. One is that choice by itself is, is um, not, much of an uh, not much of a magic elixir. Um, uh, uh, we've had a lot of choice for many years uh, in Detroit now, um, something like 15 or close to it. Um, and I would argue that uh, results for Detroit kids um, are largely unchanged. Um, uh, said another way, um, we're really being asked to choose in some respects between an unregulated marketplace and a regulated marketplace. Um, and I think playing practical politics here, um, the obvious better choice is a regulated marketplace. Uh, an unregulated marketplace, uh, particularly when it comes to the futures of our kids, is, uh, it just um, strikes me as um, kind of ridiculously foolish. Uh, and I would just hope that all of us would figure out what are appropriate regulations to put in place to make sure that we're creating a marketplace that has some chance of working. Um, 
things like apples to apples comparisons, and particularly in a situation where feedback loops are slow. You don't get a sense about whether a school is high performing or not for some time. It's not like you get the product home and unwrap it and realize it's broken and can take it right back to the store and decide never to buy from that vendor or that, that particular brand again. It takes a little while with schools, um, and so apples to apples comparisons are important. And at the same time, a front end standard is important uh, as opposed to mere back end accountability. Um, I hear folks um, say all the time, uh, I want to take, I am a supporter of, of, of choices. Um, as I said, I, I, a supporter of regulated choices, not unregulated, um, but believe that folks should have the opportunity to send their kids where they want to school. Um, that having been said, I hear folks who are supporters of charter schools say frequently that, well, uh, you know, at least some charters have closed. Uh, um, presumably due to underperformance over the past few years. Um, we've never, you know, seen a traditional K-12 district close. Um, that may be true. And that having been said, like, to have six criminals caught after the fact out of 100 is no grounds for celebration. Um, yes, maybe it's a step in the right direction to see some schools closing for low performance, but um, not nearly um, the right, not nearly enough of the right direction if we actually care about outcomes for kids. So better than trying to figure out how to get enough police on the streets to catch all the bad school actors after the fact, um, uh, how about we actually prevent the bad school actors from opening in the first place? If you have a track record that says you're doing wrong by kids, it is unconscionable, unconscionable that anybody in this state would allow that school operator or authorizer to expand their portfolio. It makes no sense for our kids or our families. So um, I'll get off my high horse, really uh, pleased to see that we're willing to take a stand um, around what effective regulation of a marketplace of schools might look like. There'll be time in the future for us to decide, yay or nay, whether we liked a particular proposal that gets submitted to the legislature. Um, and I'll send that language, uh, I'll provide that language uh, with regard to the first two paragraphs as well. Thanks. You know, some of what Dan said on regulation, by the way, John, I appreciate your acknowledgement of what Marty led in our department, but the whole team worked on at length, which are technical sounds, uh, it doesn't sound sexy, you know, as some broad policy issues, but very important to very issues like regulation and whether or not we actually can carry out. Because the, the part that you acknowledged uh, was that, and we're, we're going to, we're going to send in also with the board's uh, commentary on this is is really trying to fix the 1979 thing that's been in place for all that time and and take out the contradictions and put in there uh, in a precise way so you saw the legislative committee did and I think the whole board got the many pages that are just what we're calling technical amendments but I do think there's room to build on that as this goes through with respect to the board's work on regulation because that'll have an impact on some of the technical issues too after this first round. Nancy, Nancy. Nancy had it. <clears throat> to take off on what Dan just said, which by the way I agree with, um, I think the tone of what's written here, while well intended, takes away from what we need to make certain we get across, which is public education in Michigan must be judged by the same levels of quality, whatever they're called, whether they're called a charter school or a magnet school or a traditional public school or a uh, I, I, whatever you call them. They have to have the same levels of quality as standards in order for accountability to even have any, any value because you cannot hold people accountable if you're holding them accountable to different standards and calling them all public schools. So I think that that's something that I would like to see in here if we could find verbiage that would talk about how, and, I, and just very quickly so it's not well written. In that first line under quality control where it says much of the proposed financing plan assumes or is complemented by authoring new schools, and they talk about the whole system must ensure the new school, no. Not, not all these new schools must ensure, but just as with any other public school, these schools must ensure 
that we have high quality, that we have high standards. But I think it's important to tie that, that just as we ensure with every other school, so too must these be done. And so if I think if we can go through this document and kind of make certain that we're reiterating that, that we're keeping that commonality there, that this we aren't holding this separate, although in some ways we will from the technical standpoint, but it, at, at the very basic, very, very basic level, they are public schools, and all public schools must subscribe and hold to these following elements. Then I think that that carries us a long way to make certain that they understand that we're not just the board of no, we're saying <laughs> that, seriously, because I've heard that, and I would like to have people understand that what we are is consistent, and that in order to serve all children in the state, we have to consistently apply our standards to all schools in the state. So that would be my comment. Thank you. Um, let me make a suggestion. I think listening to everybody um, and consistent with what Cassandra articulated, um, you know, the, the, this is not going to obviously get done in lame duck, Eileen, uh, but the um, reactions to it, ideas of how to further goals that are stated for it that may improve upon how they could be done well, uh, all of that uh, will inform uh, the public discussion, the way the governor chooses to react to it. So I think it would be very healthy <coughs> if there was a version of this in that spirit. These are um, issues, concerns, and ideas, uh, uh, our thoughts on these topics to offer at this point that could come from the board. Um, with, I think if, if we made the, with the small changes that were already made today, um, and Nancy, if you see any more tonality issues, because I, I, I certainly tried to tone it down or up um, towards the goal that you described. Um, um, maybe we could um, bring this back at this afternoon and uh, ideally, you know, approve a version, approve it um, with some small changes, which I think I've heard a number which are, are I'm, I welcome. Um, and if you see any more, Nancy, maybe we could do that. That would be my hope, is that we could say something together. These are our um, thoughts at this stage on, on these important topics and reactions to this proposal that we want to um, uh, be able to uh, insert into the public discussion and, and continue to take it back to committee, as Eileen says, keep working on our positioning vis-a-vis uh, -vis how we accomplish these goals and how we react to uh, further uh, ideas that may come through a sausage machine and we don't know what they're going to be. Um, but we want to inform that and, and we may be helpful in that. So I hope we could do that. If we don't have the votes to pass something with some small changes, you know, then I think it's incumbent upon me and then I would encourage every board member to publicly offer, given this invitation, to offer your public reactions to these proposals. But I would rather, obviously, have it be a, a, a set of ideas that reflect the collective, if not, you know, consensus view of the board. Do you think we could do that? Come tune the, just wordsmith, take the changes that have been made and bring back a document after lunch, which we'd have to do anyway, and see if we can uh, approve it. And uh, if it fails, then we will continue to uh, beat our drums uh, on this topic thoughtfully, which is what I know we all want to do. Yeah. Kathy. I too want to, I want to be part of that. I want to be part of forming the school, so to speak. There are a lot of things you say in here that I certainly agree with. I think you talk about the K-6 should stay in one place instead of picking and choosing and what they're going to pay for. That would be pretty hard to pull off, I think. Uh, the importance of high school experiences beyond the curriculum. I know my own son has benefited more from the extracurricular activities that he participated in, like uh, being edited with a school paper, working on plays, being, being in the theater, so to speak, uh, sharing a United Nations conference, held in the school, you know, with he had all kinds of experiences that proved to be very valuable to him, and which you don't get with uh, online learning that I can mm -hmm. see. And it's not that I'm opposed to all online learning. As I said before, the blended learning is done well. It has to be done. All of these things have to be done well. That's the trick. <laughs> That's the catch, so to speak. It really gets kids engaged and involved, provided there's 
there's good mentoring and teaching of in person with live people. Uh, I've seen it. We all know the ones we've talked about, the way it's programmed, particularly. But I, I think there's something, you know, I'm not against everything that's being proposed, but there's so many things here that go way beyond what's necessary to improve, what I think, to improve education. And I still say our schools are better than anybody gives them credit for. <coughs> they, uh, there's been a constant campaign, I would say, a very clever public relations campaign for 20, 30 years to discredit public education. And <coughs> whether it's to privatize it so that the private sector gets more of the billions of dollars that are spent, I don't know what the reason is, but that's what's been happening. And it's, it's, to me, it's very frightening because I still think that public education is what keeps us uh, uh, keeps our democracy. We, to maintain a democracy, we need a good, strong public education system. And everything is geared to uh, individual interests, which is good to support individual interests, but everybody has to learn certain things. And we have to teach people to be good citizens as well as to be good employees someplace, whatever the job is. That's actually, in my mind, so important, and it keeps getting pushed aside, and nobody talks about it, and I, I get very upset about that. I think we have to talk about it more. But I think there's a lot in here, John, that, that I agree with, but maybe we could simplify it and make those points a little stronger and leave out some of the other stuff. <laughs> but I think it's great that you did this. I mean, it's really impressive. Mm -hmm. Well, why don't we shoot for that? I, if, if, with the right. board's permission, we'll try to look at some of this wording over lunch. And I, I do think I, I, it fits with, frankly, I've tried to counsel some of the associations that if you can get in with some of your thinking, kind of with the caveat that Dan got on the table, doesn't mean you're supportive of everything in there. It can actually impact something before it ever becomes a bill, and then you're not on a defense. Yeah. You've, already, you've already created something there that they thought, oh, you know, that's a good point. Let's amend that that phraseology or let's change that concept. So that would be ideal, but we'll, you know, see what happens this afternoon. And uh, yes, Nance. I, I just want to add one quick thing here as I'm listening to my fellow board members. One of the one of the pieces that I found most instructive under the mem memorandum that we got from from the governor's office on, on um, the Oxford Foundation work that I think we need to keep in mind. I agree that all means all, mm -hmm. but when we say all means all, it doesn't mean in the same capacity or the same way for all. It means that if something works for one person, we ought to allow that to happen as opposed to saying all kids have to have access to it. Because maybe, maybe for all kids that isn't important. And one of the pieces in this, on the page three of this, uh, ten page tome was was um, um, <laughs> was the concept was the concept that um, what they were trying to reach out to were those who had been disenfranchised from education and so they were trying to create a system where those that were disenfranchised were re-enfranchised agree with what they've said about how they want to do that or not that concept to me is critical as we move forward is how do we re-engage those have who have become disenfranchised. If we're going to reach all children and all parents and all communities, we have to consider that question. And so I would ask that as we make those changes and as we readjust and, and uh, put something out, that we keep that central to what we're thinking about is does this allow for re-enfranchisement as well as making the best of who's already there? Because I think that really is